All praise to the Most High and the Son, Jesus Christ. Uh, we give thanks to the Most High for allowing us to be here again, just keeping our, uh, keeping our spirits up as we endure through the tumultuous times that we are living in. Uh, Deacon Malachi had did a wonderful class uh, earlier today, as well as Deacon Yahshua. Deacon Yahshua particularly uh, hit on something. Uh, he pulled one particular word. And he spoke about the dangers of mediocrity. And I think that's a great segue to deal in the uh, class that I want to bring up. So shout out to all of the, uh, the deacons and the captains and the uh, officers that are on the teaching circuit and the soldiers that's on the teaching circuit to give our people this gospel. So uh, first of all, let me say shalom to my brothers and sisters that are following us online. I have to take a, a page out of Bishop Nathaniel's uh, book and say, we also uh, welcome our frenemies, okay? The, 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 the <laughs> I'm not going to deviate and deal in the abyss of the Negro shenanigans and madness. I'm not going to do that. Uh, we will be claiming this time slot and airwaves for the Most High for his purpose of waking up the 12 tribes of Israel. We will not deal with the uh, madness. We have, we have avenues to deal with such, but this is not that avenue. However, they can follow and learn to repent and get their minds right, and that would be, uh, that would be advisable. That would be advisable. Um, let's see. Let's see. The name of today's class is The Defiant Ones in Ordered Discipline. The Defiant Ones in ordered discipline, in ordered discipline, okay? Now, when people hear that term defiant, it has, in, in some circles, there's some negative connotations to that, okay? When you talk about somebody being rebellious, because another word for defiant is to be a rebel. But the defiance that we're talking about here is a righteous type of uh, defiance. I'm talking about a, a, a stern discipline type of defiance where you are not swayed by the shenanigans of evil, by the, sh by, 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 the, by the temptations of the wicked. You're being defiant against evil. You're being defiant against temptations. You're being defiant against slothfulness. And that's the reason why I particularly honed in on when Deacon Joshua brought out about mediocrity. Mediocrity has no uh, seat. <laughs> I say seat, right? has no chair in, uh, in Israel, <laughs> okay, has no chair in the nation of Israel, <laughs> Lord have mercy, um, defiant, okay, let's, 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 let's deal with defiant, and let's deal with it on both ends, and then I'm going to, I'm, Nashawn, I know I told you, uh, hold the scripture, but you know, I'm about to do a little something. Let me, let me deal with defiant first. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let me show you two different levels of defiant. Let me get the Negro side of defiant first, and I'm going to explain it. Give me the book of Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. Okay, let me, let me explain a particular defiant, because you do have people within the nation of Israel, men, women, who are defiant against the Most High's correction. Correction goes out. People get a defiant, rebellious attitude and will scapegoat the receipts and still go on the rampage of attacks. <laughs> so there you go with that. Uh, let's read that. Let's read that. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. These six things does the Lord hate. These six things does the Lord hate. Go ahead. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Yet seven are an abomination unto him. So these are abominations that we're about to read about here. Listen to this abomination coming up right here. A proud look. A proud look. A proud look. Let me just get my thing together here. A proud look. Read that again. A proud look. A proud look. When we talk about pride, there's nothing wrong with pride if it's in the right place. When you talk about, def when we, like, 
like our title says, the defiant ones in order discipline. There's a level of pride that comes with that defiance as long as, it is, as, long as that defiance fit within ordered discipline. Okay? So that is a level of pride that we do want. You feel me? We, in other words, we're supposed to be proud of our heritage. We're supposed to be proud of, of how we conduct uh, uh, kindness and, and, and business and, and respect and love towards each other. We're supposed to be proud in that. We're supposed to be proud in forgiveness. We're supposed to be proud, meaning on the right way, when we come to dealing with each other. Be proud in your nation. Be proud of your achievements. That is, the pride that we're talking about here is not that. Read that again. A proud look. A proud look means against the Most High. That's what this is talking about. The Most High said he considers that an abomination. He said that kind of pride, I don't want that. A proud look. Read. A lying tongue. A lying tongue goes along with your steel hard-headed pride. Can't be corrected. Can't be told nothing. Just straight up defiant and lies. Read that again. A proud look. A proud look. Go ahead. A lying tongue. A lying tongue. Go ahead. And hands that shed innocent blood. And also, along with this pride and a lying tongue, you will also incorporate your nasty hands, your wicked hands, to shed innocent blood. You will look to attack your brothers when knowing damn well you was in the wrong. And instead of, and instead of, uh, and instead of allowing the correction, because it's just easy to say, you know what, we messed up. But no, you will obfuscate, cover it up, scapegoat, do all kinds of things to try to find all kinds of shenanigans to move you away from what the actual point is about. That's some evil wickedness right there. That's what the Most High is talking about when he says he hates that. A proud look. Read that whole verse again. Yes, sir. A proud look. A proud look, meaning proud against God's commandments. God's commandments tell us how to deal. Go ahead. A lying tongue. A lying tongue. Does the Bible condone lying? Talk to me. No. So why in the world would we lie to save face? To cover. We don't want, we don't want, to, we don't want to humble ourselves to absolute truth. When truth comes out, be man enough to say, you know what? I'm wrong. Rather than try to find all kinds of other whole kinds of scapegoats and bypass, and you think people stupid. People are not stupid. People know what the hell they saw. So I'm just, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to give this to nothing. I'm not going to give this time slot to nobody but the Most High. My prayer is that for all of Israel to repent. I have no ill bone against anybody, none of them. I would say we'll all repent because they are my people. All of these brothers and sisters are our people. And we have to, and we have to take the oversight and go beyond and, and stand up and do the right thing, hoping that it might change a few of them, hoping that it might bring them to repentance and say, you know what? I really didn't know they were like that. Read. Read that again. A proud look. A proud look. Go a, ahead. A lying tongue. A lying tongue. Go ahead. And hands that shed innocent blood. And hands that shed innocent blood. Is there more on that? The That's it on 18. that. Huh? You want verse 18? Keep what it say? And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Instead of just saying what the truth is, you will come up with all of these. You'll come up with, a, you'll come up with lies. You'll come up with uh, wanting to commit violence on brothers. What was the other thing it said? And uh, the and, verse before that? In hands that shed innocent blood. His hands that shed innocent blood. A proud look against his commandments. A lying tongue. A lying tongue. And hands that be quick to shed innocent blood. Go ahead. And heart that deviseth wicked imagination. Instead of just repenting, why in the world would you scour all over the place and try to find some way to do the Jedi mind trick on everybody that saw what was going on to try to switch their attention to something else? And you think that's going to work. The Lord says, I hate all of that. The easiest thing for any of us, because any of us could be wrong. Any of us could mess up. Any of us could make mistakes. The easiest thing would be, you know what? I messed up. I shouldn't have did this. I shouldn't have did that. Brothers and sisters, I repent. And then you don't have to go down a hole coming up with another lie to cover up another lie and a whole another lie. <laughs> that sounds like Enron. 
more cheating to cover up the old cheating, to cover up another cheating, cover. Come on, brothers. We can do better than this. All right. So that's it for the for the Negro shenanigans. Um, so like I said, our our job is to raise the 12 tribes of Israel. OK, that's what our job is. Give me Micah four and ten. Micah chapter four and verse ten. Now I'm reading this because now I'm going into the defiant ones in order discipline because this is the right side of defiance, not in the rebellion. This is the right side of being defiant in the face of our in the in the face of terrorism and in the face of our uh, um, enemies that set that seek to set us back. We have to have a level of defiance to defy against all of their advances to destroy us. And the Lord gives us the blueprint on how to get that done in righteousness. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Okay, read. Micah chapter 4, verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. The Bible says be in pain and labor. Pain, pain, pain. Because we're going to talk about that pain a little bit. Be in pain, meaning that it's not comfortable to go against the grain of wickedness. The, the, it's, it's so common for us to just relax and do nothing and just let the whole nation of Israel go into all kinds of evil and destruction. But it takes, it takes real work to stand up in the face of tyranny, in the face of, of, of being bombarded with evil. Give me that in Psalms 90, uh, what is it, 94 or 96? 94.16, right? 94.16. Here's an example of the, the exhibition of pain. Okay? Watch this. Psalms chapter 94, verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? The reason why this is written this way is because this is not something that's common for a lot of people. It had to be written this way because it's, making, it's challenging who will be the one that will stand up as opposed to many of us that just lie down. As opposed to many of us that say, you know what, I'm going to envelop myself in the evil. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to relish the evil, and I'm not even going to try to stand up against the evil and stand up for what's right. But that Bible says what? Read that. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? The Bible says who, who among us will stand up? And it's going to be painful when we do this. It's, it's going to take work and labor to stand up against the workers of iniquity. Read it. Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Because that's going to take pain. That's going to take labor. That's going to take organization. That's going to take trial and error. That's going to take gathering with brothers, gathering with sisters, setting up order. Watching when this one slip up and mess up and, this, and how, how you correct them to put them back on the right path. That's going to take work. That's, that's not going to be easy. You're trying to organize a people that have been incubated in wickedness ever since we were brought over here on the slave ships. That's not going to be easy work. Although the Most High said it's an easy thing to raise up the 12 tribes of Jacob, the Israelites, but it's still our job to actually go there and do that. The scriptures say, let our light shine. So that's what we must do. So in order to let our light shine, we have to go and find those brothers and sisters and bring them up out of darkness. And that's not going to be easy when they have been morphed into, nor, uh, into a life that they think is normal to live a life of sin. You got to change their whole mindset. They have to be renewed in their minds in order to get them out of that. It's a lot of work, pain and labor. That's what it's going to take to bring forth Zion. Read, read the verse again. Who will rise up for me? The Bible says, who will rise up for the most high? Go ahead. Against the evildoers. Against the evildoers. Those that do evil because it's easy to participate in evil. In an evil society. You're just going with the flow. There's no resistance there. But when you decide to go against the current, that's where, that's where, that's where the defiance come in. Because you know something about righteousness Although everybody else is following wicked, like the scriptures say, wide is the gate to destruction, but narrow is the way to righteousness. You know that that slither of righteousness in the narrow path is greater than all of the wickedness that's coming towards you. And just because you know that, that gives you purpose to fight against all of the evil that's coming your way. Read that again. 
Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Go ahead. Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Uh, who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? So that's a question to us as men, as women, as young, as young men, as young women, boys, girls. All of us have to make that decision. All of us have to make that choice. And in making that choice, it will be painful because you're in a system that encourages evil, that encourages lies, that encourages deceit, abominations. It encourages that. Okay? But God is on our side. You hear me? Yes, sir. God is on our side. And that's the only hope we need. As long as we know that God is on our side, our perseverance towards that righteousness is a little bit easier because we know that there is a reward for this. And that's what we have to do. Okay? Where there is no vision, the people perish. You have to have that vision in your mind to be single in thought in terms of where you're going and, be, and, and have that purpose driven hard. That's the defiance that we're talking about. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. That's what, we, that's what I'm going to go into. Okay, now. Defiance comes from the drive of determination. Determination, let's look that up. Uh, read that. Determination, Who's definition one. Who's by the way? Where you at? Who's that? I'll see you Joshua. Joshua. All praise to the Lord. Hey, by the way, glad to have you here, my brother. All praise to the Lord. Give the Lord a hand. Officer Yehoshua, the, the Lord has definitely moved in favor of you, my brother. Glad to have you here. Let's bring it on out. Determination. On. Firmness of purpose. Hold it. Firmness of purpose. This is determination. Firmness of purpose, meaning that we are not wavering. Like the scriptures say, a double-minded man is, is unstable in all his ways. So we're not double-minded when it comes to our purpose, when it comes, when it comes to our vision. We know exactly what we're doing, and we're going to follow that to the T. Okay, read that again. Determination. Firmness. Firmness, firmness of, meaning unyielding, uncompromising, unbend, uh, unbending. Go ahead. Firmness of, of purpose. Of purpose. Purpose is your vision. Go ahead. Resoluteness. Resolute in our standing up for God, in our standing up for this truth, in this truth. Go ahead. Uh, jump down. The two. Definition two. The process of establishing something exactly by calculation or research the 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 establishing exactly by calculation means the calculation of the bible that's what it's talking about so the process of establishing something exactly according to the bible and we are resolute in that we are firm in that we are unflinching did we read that word there go back up there to the, uh right there he advanced with unflinching determination that's the, had a little uh, definition there. So y'all see that, right? We advance in this gospel, we advance in this truth and this vision with unflinching determination. So the determination is going back to us being defiant to make sure that we don't let, uh, we won't allow anything to cause deviation of us following this, pro this protocol, this Bible. Y'all all right? Unflinching, unyielding. So that's what I'm talking about. When I say the defiant ones, we're talking about those that believe in this. That's what we're talking about. So, again, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, preface this discussion by showing you the negative side of what people might attribute uh, defiance. But uh, and then on the other side, I wanted to show you what defiance means in terms of what the Most High is talking about. So we are the defiant ones, and our def and our uh, and our being defiant is an ordered discipline, okay? So there's no defiance without God's discipline. God trained us. The Most High trained us. He sharpened us. He organized us, and we are to be disciplined in following that order. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Okay, moving on, moving on. So now, I want to make this point. Uh, so I said that determination, I said defiance comes from the drive of determination, and determination itself comes from an action that is deemed necessary. Why would you be, why would you uh, be determined about something if it's not necessary? 
If you find something that's necessary, if it's necessary, then you must do it. You must be determined to make sure that what's necessary gets met. If it's necessary, then you have to put the attributes, the pain and the labor to make sure that what's necessary and uh, that's necessary gets done. And that's the and your drive is the determination that that meets what's necessary or meets what's lacking. Give me uh, Titus one and five. Uh, Deacon Yashua read it earlier. Here's an example of what we have to be determining. And that's the reason why I say we're not gonna we're not gonna sidetrack and deal with madness. The most high has got a people out there that must be awakened. And that's what our job is. You got it? Yes, sir. Titus one and five. Titus chapter one and verse five. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order that thou should set in order. So there's work again. Order had to be set up. In the areas where, where Paul has sent Titus. Read that. That thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. The things that are lacking. To set in order the things that are lacking. So in order to do this, he had to look around and, and, and examine what's necessary. That's what it means when it says what's lacking meaning what's needed. What's necessary in these sanctuaries? What's, ne what's, what's necessary in these countries? What's necessary in these towns, in these cities, in these countries where we travel? What's necessary there? And once we establish what is necessary, then there must be a determination to make sure that the needs get met. We cannot be playing with bull crap while we got work to do. I don't have time to play with the Negro. Huh? Yes, sir. We got too much work to do. Y'all feel me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, now, so determination is the result of an, uh, it comes from an action that is deemed necessary because if it's necessary, then we are determined to make sure that we get it done. And necessary comes from pain, once again, from being slothful. Now, let me explain that. Let me explain that part. We had a time period where we had the kingdom, but we got comfortable. We got relaxed. Y'all all right? And we kicked, like the scriptures say, Jacob kicked and waxed fat. Kicked, there's a scripture that talks about that. We got lazy. We got comfortable. We took our eyes off God. We took our eyes off of what is to keep you motivated and keeping up with this discipline that would keep us out of trouble? We got comfortable. Put up my, yeah, before we put it up there, let me, yeah, put it up there. Because this is what I'm going to talk about now. Set it on the screen. When we got comfortable, this is the pain of once again being slothful. We were delivered out of, when we were in Egypt, we was getting our backs whipped. We all caught hell, huh? I mean, we was really catching hell. Uh, hey, we, was, we were united when we, was coming out of that, uh, when we was coming out of captivity. But when we got some liberty in the wilderness, then the Negro budded. <laughs> the Negro grew. Huh? But while, while Pharaoh was putting us in them pits and making us build, we was, we was brother to brother then. Y'all all right? Because hard times, hard times create strong men. Strong enough to unite with your brothers and listen, we all, we all catching hell. But if we get to a point where we think that we're no longer in hell, then we begin to turn on each other. And we forgot that it was that discipline that kept us out of the problem in the first place. Y'all all right? So, let's look at this here. Hard times create strong men. Now, y'all can. Now, we went over this a few times, but I want to say this because I know there's other brothers and sisters that are watching. And let me make this, let me make this uh, statement here. When we do these classes like this here, and the reason why I say that we give these airwaves to the Most High, because we're not trying to, quote unquote, preach to the choir. Brothers and sisters that's in this congregation, they know these things already. Our job is to reach those that don't know this. Okay? We want to be wise. We want to, like the scriptures say, the, on, the, on, the, on the bad side of things, we are wise to do evil. But to do good, we have no knowledge. Our, our defiance have to be against that 
and to take what is good and make it better. Why not use these airwaves for God's purpose rather than using it to slander and, and destroy your brothers? That's wise to do evil. You feel me? But in the case where we're talking about, we're going to use the tools that God gave to wake up the 12 tribes of Israel. Y'all all right? That's our job. Okay? So, in, in hard times, the hard times, we don't want to feel those hard times. So, it makes, it makes us bond together and work as a people. And then once, once the fruit of you working together begins to manifest, it's okay, now we can, we can sit back and relax now because we, we did, notice this, we did the hard work, now we can relax. And some of us begin to do just that. When we relax, then the, then the thing says, strong men create good times. So the hard times is what made you unite. Then, the, then once you united, the benefits came, and that brought on the good times. When it brought on the good times, that's when we went to sleep. We got niggerish. We became the Negro. We became belligerent. We forgot the rock that brought us. We left the most high in the heavens like we don't need you anymore. We got it. We good. And once we did that, our enemy said, well, this is the time to move on them now because they've forgotten the rock that begot them. Y'all all right? And because of that, those good times that we thought we were enjoying created weak men because what happened? Our homes were destroyed. Our families were destroyed. Men are growing up. Boys are growing up with no fathers. Drugs is all in our communities. We, we, have, we, hate, we hate one another. We hate our sisters. We hate our brothers. We hate all of, the, all of these things we hate. So while this stuff is happening, what happens? We begin to fall into a weak posture. Good times created weak men. Weak men. And once you b get broken all the way down, we right back into the cycle of weak men have to learn how to off, uh, offset the, the, the tenets of, of losing everything. And now we got to build back up again. And that's where the hard times come in. Because the hard times is what's going to make you wake up. What does scripture say? In thy, in thy affliction will thou seek me early. That's what it's talking about here. So that's the hard times. So we're at that point again. So I wanted to I mentioned all of that to make this point here. To make this point. Because we, we did not choose to maintain the discipline all throughout all of these stages here. Hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak men create hard times. Through all of those different parts of, our, of this circle, we should have always maintained a level of discipline because there's always a force that's always trying to destroy us. There should never be, regardless of how good, quote unquote, good the times are, there should always be some watchmen on guard that watching out for evil. Never lay back. Always be circumspect of evil. Always. That's what the that's the lesson. Always be defiant. Always be on guard. Always watch. To, some people might call it paranoid. It's not paranoid. It's mindful of what's out there. We can never get to a point of just thinking that we're just going to be okay. There's always, the Bible says good is set against evil. That means there's, all, there's a constant battle to try to take you into wickedness. If we know that, that means we must always be on guard. That's my point, right? All right. Um, so, here's the point. Because we chose not to be disciplined, the consequences of us not being disciplined are forever stacked against us. I shouldn't say forever because we're about to change that with the word of the most high. But, these, but the consequences of our slothfulness is what's mounting against us daily. Our women are feeling it. Our men are feeling it. Our old men, women, children, we're all feeling it. So we have to be those that stand up for righteousness sake. And it's going to take pain and labor to bring, the, and bring this forward. Go back to that, uh, what you was reading, pain and labor. Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. 
Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There shall we be delivered. Read that again. Be in pain and labor to so bring. In, so in order for us to make sure that, that we are on the right track, we have to be in pain and labor to bring forth, to bring forth the gospel, to bring forth this, this truth, to wake up the 12 tribes of Israel. It's going to take pain. There's a lot of enemies against us, not just the so-called white man, but Negroes and all of them. The whole, the whole world, the scriptures say that ye shall be hated for my name's sake. What do you think it's going to take to persevere through all of that? It's going to take pain and labor and work and organization, trial and error, counsels, all kinds of things to help pierce through this. And the Lord said, I got you. Just stay with me. He wants to try us to make sure that we are fit for this battle because it is a battle. But we're not just trying to win the battle. We're trying to win the war. Understand that. Okay. Uh, read. Read that again. Be in pain and labor to bring forth. O daughter of Zion. Go ahead. Like a woman in travail. Like a woman in travail. That's the kind of pain that we're going to go through. We're going to suffer some, e some evil on this end, some, some slander on that end, some outright attacks on another end. We're going we're gonna to suffer these things. Read that again. As like a woman. In travail. Like a woman in travail. Pain here, a pain there. These are going to be trials that's going to come to try to beset our growth. And when I say our growth, I'm not necessarily talking about IUIC. I'm talking about the program of the Lord. Because this world is about the destruction of all Israelites. Any of us that are teaching the Bible, particularly Deuteronomy the 28, to wake up the tribes of Israel is an enemy to the system. Is an enemy to, to, uh, to, the, um, to, the, uh, to the gospel that we're preaching. They want this stopped and that's where Haman Malone is all about. The so-called apologetics, ADL, Canary Mission, right. SPLC, all of them. It's all about stopping this gospel. So we have to be in pain to get through that. And there's going to be a text that's going to come at us just like a woman that's in travail. Read on. For now shall I go forth out of the city. For now shall we go out of the city, meaning where we're at right now, Babylon the Great. That's what it's going to talk about. Read on. And thou shalt dwell in the field. Go ahead. And thou shalt go even to Babylon. And thou shalt go even to Babylon. That's where we're at now. Okay. So this, this, these trials have been with us since the beginning. All throughout our captivities, we were going through this. But now we're in Babylon the Great. Listen now. There. Shall thou be delivered. There, from Babylon the Great, we're going to be delivered. So now we was in ancient Babylon. We weren't delivered from ancient Babylon and went into our kingdom. So that ain't the Babylon that the Bible's talking about in this instance. Read that statement again. There shall thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thy enemies. Thou, there the Lord shall redeem the nation, the 12 tribes of Israel, from the hand of all that hate us, like it says in Luke. That's what this is talking about. When we, when we, was, when we came out of the Babylonian captivity, we went under Persia in captivity again. Then after Persia, Greece. Then after, then after Greece, Rome. So... That's not the deliverance that we read in here. Read that statement again. There, the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of all thy enemies. From all our enemies, not just the Babylonians. That's where we're at now. When we get out of this captivity here, that's it. Y'all all right? This is what we have to hold on to. Hold that line. Y'all all right? What's my, what's my brothers out there? Juvie, got to hold on. I like that song. Huh? Yeah. Did I say his name right? Ju, Ju, Juville, right? What is it? Juville. Juville. Okay, I'm talking about Juvie. <laughs> the hell is going on here? Damn, I got it. You say. <laughs> I got a joke, man. I ain't going to say that. Somebody said, damn, they go talking that, that, that kind of stuff there because that's what we do, blah, blah, blah. I'm the, again, leave the Negro to his antics. Um, <laughs> so, like I said, we are to work against these consequences that has been stacked against us. 
and we have to take on that that breastplate breastplate of righteousness to establish justice among us, to establish righteousness in our nation, to establish that we deal with each other properly. This is what we have to do, and it is a fight. It is it is it is about pain and labor that we have to bring forward to make all of this happen. So. What must we do? What should we do and what must we do in our objective? What should our objective be? We must begin a system of organized thinking that supports the actions and results of beneficial changes that actually corrects decades, perhaps centuries, decades of irresponsible negligence, which is exactly why we suffer the things that we suffer today. Did y'all understand that? Because when we went to sleep, that's when the grass grew up under our feet, the grass of wickedness, so you can understand. We didn't pay attention to, what, to the evils that was gaining on us. But now we got to work twice as hard now to get back to where we're supposed to get. Give me that in uh, Baruch 4, uh, 428. 428, okay? Y'all notice that when y'all walk in here, we have a sign above the door, right? The welcome home, right? And it means that. And the scripture is up there too. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Baruch four and twenty-eight. Listen, this is, this is this is, and it's it's very important that we really uh, relish in that statement because this is the kind of fight that we have to do because we we went so long in mediocrity, we went so long in slothfulness. We just allowed things to just grow and just. And we didn't, we didn't put labor to make sure that, that the home front was all right. And we got comfortable and we just allowed things to just get wild until it got so bad. Now all of a sudden we're trying to rush to get it right. But by that way, you done lost generations of your children. You have lost all kinds of things because we were not on guard forever. We are supposed to have always been on guard. We men I'm talking about. We have to always be on guard. Okay, what you got? Baruch chapter 4 and verse 28. For as it was your mind to go astray from God. For it was our mind to deal in slothfulness. For it was our mind to follow evil, lies, slander. It was our mind to, to deal with, with illicit sexual acts, and acts with our sisters with no intent to marry them or take care of their children or to take care of your children now because you got the child with her. We left all of that alone. We just, quote, unquote, having fun. Now we got all, now we got all of this, these children growing up with no fathers, and that alone just creates a whole sea of madness. These men grow up with no, with no kind of perception on what life is supposed to be or anything, and they got to, quote, unquote, go out there and make a way for themselves with no guidance. Then this wicked society puts a gun in their hands, give them dope, and say, here's your way. You can make it like this here. Shoot your brothers and dope up your brothers. And you can have the Mercedes Benz with the this and that and the other. And that's, that's where our community has gone. Why? Because we fell asleep. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. We got to fight to reverse all of that. It's real work involved. Real work involved. And we at the elder seat cannot do it alone. You won't hear us just talk about us at the, at the, at the quote-unquote top level of the organization and say that, listen, it's all us. No, all of us got to, get in the, got to get in the mud and pull the whole truck out. We all got to do that work. Y'all all right? That's what leadership is all about. I, I, I played something last night that I think, uh, no, nah, I'm not going to deviate. I'm not going to deviate. Let me just stay with it. There was a cartoon. I said I, said, uh, I, said I wasn't going to do it, right? To show you the importance of, uh, yes, right, there you go. The brother's going to put it right on up there. Let me just give it to you. <laughs> go ahead. Play it, man. Play it. This right here is, show, show, show the uh, thing on the screen. L leader plus teamwork equals success. So it ain't just the leader. The leader has to know how to convey the vision to the people to get them also involved so that we can all make the move. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Play this here. Watch this here. We don't need a disclaimer on this one. Go ahead. I don't think. 
Notice what's happening here. Now, as you see, all of the men, pause it, pause it, pause it, pause it. As you can see, all of these men are at the bottom in a pit, in a pit of destruction, in a pit. Let's just upgrade it to say what it is. In a pit of despair, in a pit of, of, of hopelessness, in a pit of destruction. We're all in the pot boiling, in the cauldron boiling. Somebody has to say, listen, we need to make some moves to get out of here. But all of us are basically the same height. So what could we do to get out of this pit? Watch this. Play on. As you see, somebody had to communicate some kind of order to tell these men what to do. And you notice that they're positioning themselves. Oh, stop, stop, stop. You notice that they're positioning themselves to, to allow one man to climb up all of their backs to get up at the top. Y'all notice that. But the leader that's doing this, he's got enough sense to say, wait a minute, it was my brothers that got me here. So why don't I make, make sure that I help my brothers to get up out of this thing? So that's what he's doing now. We don't, we're not even taught to think like this here. We go, we'll go to college and get all kinds of degrees or whatever, and we will leave and go live among white folks. And you get the spray paint nigga all on the house and all that. You, get, you go through all that. Excuse me if these words are like, you know. But that's what it is. I mean, they're they, they, they freaking out about my words. But actually, those, that would be on the people's houses. Huh? We don't want your kind here. That kind of thing there. And you ain't got none of your brothers. <laughs> okay? All of that. When you get up there, you're supposed to be looking around and say, how can I get the rest of my brothers that helped me get here? So that we can establish something for ourselves. Y'all all right? That's what I was picking up out of this. Start the video again. I'm going to just let it play so y'all can see what the deal is. So you see how they're jumping on top of each other to make a ladder, basically. So as they did on all of that, they had to look among them and say, which one of us is fit to actually make that last jump to get up there? And the man knows how to build that thing to pull his brothers up. Notice that while he's helping his brothers up, he's standing guard to make sure that all of his men get up there. Because when he goes and sets something up, I got my brothers with me. So you're not going to spray uh, all kinds of epithets on my house because all of us are there. And you're going to have some trouble. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. But that's what we have to do. That's how we got to think. Move as a team. Never move alone. Okay? That's what this is talking about. Leader plus teamwork equals success. You can't have one without the other. You can't. Teamwork doesn't work without vision. Doesn't work without a leader. The leader has to be able to instill, success, uh, to, uh, instill a vision of success in the people's minds. Then they can formulate the team to make it happen. And when it's happening, everybody's going to benefit from it. Y'all all right? This is what we fail to do. And because we fail to do it, we are, we are stuck with the consequences that we're stuck with now. So now we have to work twice, ten times harder to undo the decades of negligence to put us back into the race of getting ourselves together. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Go back to um, you want to Baruch. That in Baruch. Yes, sir. That's where I'm going. Baruch. Thank you. Thank Bar you. Baruch, chapter 4, verse 28. For as it was your mind to go astray from God. For, it, for as it was our mind to go to sleep, to go astray from God. Go ahead. So being returned. So being returned. Seek him ten times more. We have to fight ten times harder. Because in our absence of doing the work, many uh, contaminants have came into our lives. Many bacterials have came in and have messed up. The things that were before us. The longer we sit and become slothful, uh, bacteria, spiritual bacteria, so to speak, fills the void. If you leave your house unclean for a month as opposed to 10 minutes, how much harder? Let me do it. Let me, let me stretch it out a little bit. If you left your house dirty for a year, as opposed to a day. Understand this. For one day, you said, the next day I'm going to clean it up. You cleaned up the house 
two days later. So you, you went through a, a certain level of work to get that house back up to par. But if you waited a whole year to go clean that house up, how much harder would you have to work to get that house back up to spec? That's, that's what happened to us. We've allowed our house to degrade. We allowed, we allowed our uh, house to erode, meaning our families. We've allowed our communities to erode. And now we just can't, quote, unquote, fix it. We have to deal with the erosion that has happened. So that's going to take 10 times more work. So f for that reason, we can never take our hands off the wheel. We can never take our mind off of the fact that there's always some bacteria, some enemy, some, some, some temptation or setback that's looking to retard our progress. We have to always know that there's something always trying to set us back, evil trying to set us back. So we always have to be vigilant, I mean, vigilant, vigilant, vigilant. Have to always be vigilant. You feel me? Yes, sir. Because there's always a temptation to take us in the other direction. Read that again, officer. For as it was your mind to go astray from God, so being returned, seek him ten times more. Seek him ten times more. We have to fight that much harder to bring our nation back up to the specs of what the Bible, the specifications that the Lord says that we're supposed to do. Our Constitution is the Bible. The Bible has the, Bible has the blueprint on how we are to operate. It tells us how we are supposed to act. It, this is our medical chart so you can understand. When you open up the Bible, you find out how we're supposed to act, talk, eat, walk, dress, what how the holidays to celebrate. All of that's in our medical chart. But we have went so far to the left. We are way off. So we got to fight to get back within spec of that. The specifications of the nation of Israel is recorded in the Bible. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. That's what I want us to understand. And it's going to take a level of defiance. Defiance against our own evil. Let me give you, an, uh, uh, let me give you an, another description of being defiant. Give me what Christ said. Uh, There's in two spots. One says, deny yourself. Give me that one. Look for that one. Somebody help me. Unless a man deny himself. Yeah. That, well, you can read that one too. 1426. That's, that's, that, that one is all right. Let's read that one. But there's, there's another one that used the word deny if he doesn't deny himself. Uh, let's read that one. You got 1426. Uh, Luke chapter 14 and verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife. So it ain't literally, we know this. It's not talking about hating your father and your mother and all that. But it's talking about you don't choose their ways over God's ways. You have to be defiant against the temptations of family members that are not according to the most high. That's what he's saying. Read. And children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also. That's the part that I want. And his own life also within our own lives. Even, even when we have already uh, persevered past our mothers and fathers, husbands, wives or whatever that's in the world, your friends and all that. Now you're left with your own self. And you have to hate your own thoughts. You have to hate that as well. You have to fight against that as well. Go ahead. He cannot be my disciple. So the whole point is that we have to deny that as well. Have to persevere past that as well. Okay. Um, what was I going with that? I mentioned deny. What was the point that I was making? I said to deny. Uh, did we find the other one? I think that might be it. Read that one. Matthew. Or, or what? What's the other one? Which is the one that used the word deny? Okay, give me the one. Give me that one. Right. Mark 16, 24. Okay. We have to fight against our own temptations. You have to deny that thing. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, just read that one. Let's get back on, on the get back on this train. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. Deny himself. Meaning that we have gotten comfortable 
in this lifestyle. We have gotten comfortable with being asleep. We have to fight against that as well. Deny himself. Because all of that got to change. Our mind have to change. And we got to put on the armor of the Most High. Okay, I'm going to drop that. Let's get back on to where I was at. So like I said, our job is to uh, make beneficial changes that actually corrects decades or perhaps centuries of irresponsible negligence, which is exactly why we suffer the things that we suffer today. Our blueprint, give me Isaiah 34, 16 and 17. We're going to read both of those. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. This is our blueprint. Isaiah. This is the way, this is how we get out of these. This is how we get back within spec. Go ahead. Isaiah chapter 16. Isaiah chapter 34, 34, verse 16. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. Go ahead. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Do you hear what the Bible says? We have to read our spec sheet. We have to read the Bible, the book of our fathers. We have to read, we have to read the Constitution. We have to read the book that pertains to us. Go ahead. No one of these should fail. No one of these prophecies or these instructions, all of this guidance that's in this Bible is for our benefit. We're going to read that next. This is for our benefit. None of these prophecies that the Most High said that was going to be our reality is going to fail, whether it's good or bad. Come on. None shall want her mate. You can't mate the Bible with any other book because the Bible stands alone. Go ahead. For my mouth it hath commanded. For God's mouth hath commanded these words to be written and given to the nation of Israel. That's why it says it in Romans, the third chapter. Unto thee was committed, unto the Israelites was committed the oracles of God. The oracles of God is the Bible. That was given to the nation of Israel. That was given to us. That's our Bible. That's our book. Read. In his spirit it hath gathered them. And the spirit of God hath gathered the books together. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Mark, John, Luke, he gathered that together. Moses, the books of the five books of Moses, he, ga he gathered those things of Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Haggai. He gathered all of that together. Read. And he have cast a lot for them. And he divided up. That's what it's talking about. He had cast a lot. He said, you're going to have this many chapters. Well, you're going to have this many books. Like he gave, uh, uh, let's say, uh, Nehemiah, well, let me, let me use another one. He gave uh, Paul X amount of books. He gave him Romans. He gave him Thessalonians. He gave him Corinthians. Those are books that was written by Paul. He gave Moses five, the scribes that was with him, five books. Go ahead. And his hand have divided it unto them by line. And he divided it up by line, meaning the precepts and all that that's in there. Go ahead. They, shall, they shall possess it forever. The Israelites shall possess the Bible forever. From, That's because it's our Bible. Go ahead. From generation to generation. From generation to generation. We ain't never supposed to get rid of this Bible. This book's supposed to always, this is the, the blueprint. We all supposed to be following this. Go ahead. Shall they dwell therein? Shall we dwell therein? Uh, that was 17, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we're going to, from generation to generation, this Bible is supposed to be in our possession. That's the reason why the Most High beautifully had it brought all the way up to, in our captivities and all of that. The Lord is awesome. The Lord is awesome. Now, give me the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. So we follow our blueprint. Now we're going to follow the instructions. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 second timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 all scripture is given by inspiration of god this is the blueprint on how to fix our problems as defiant men and defiant women meaning that we're going to stick strict by what this bible says read that again all scripture is given by inspiration of god the bible the most high inspired these words and we're not going to deviate from that is all given by the inspiration of the Most High. Go ahead. And it's profitable for doctrine. And the Bible is profitable to fix and solve our problems. It is profitable for doctrine. The Bible has the solution to our people's problems. Then it means just that. It is profitable for doctrine. Read it again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profit profitable for doctrine. And it is profitable for the doctrine. 
meaning on, on how to live. Because we're not living without this Bible. That's the reason why the Mosai said that our dead bodies shall lie in, this, in the great city with a spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. It's like a cesspool. Our spirits is like our spirits is like in a dunghill in this place. So we ain't got no life when it comes outside the Bible. When the scriptures also in Proverbs say, He that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the Negro. <laughs> <laughs> shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Same word. <laughs> shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Because the book of life is not within the nation of Israel at that time. But the spirit of life from God entered into them. And what did the Bible say? And they lived. And that's where we are. We live as defiant, as the defiant ones in order discipline to make sure that we carry out the tenets of this Bible. And to not deviate from the left or to the right. Is there more on that? For reproof. For correction. It is for our reproof. For, it is for our reproof. This is instruction. Whenever we're wrong, whenever we got a problem with lying and cheating, whatever, the Bible convicts us and it corrects us and it instructs us. That's what you call a good God that gives us a Bible, that gives us our constitution that really shapes us up and gives us the proper way to properly live. He made us. He definitely know what it takes for us to live. But we want to we want to deviate and live outside of that, and we end up dead. Read on. For instruction in righteousness. For instruction in righteousness. This is what the Bible is talking about. So our defiance is in righteousness. Go ahead. That the man of God may be perfect. That the man of God may be perfect because of this instruction, because of this Bible, because of this uh, this blueprint. This blueprint, this instruction is for what? Read that statement. And oh. that God, they said that the man of God. That the man of God may be perfect. This is what's going to make us perfect, brothers and sisters, when we follow this. Read on. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. To make us perfect into all good works. Everything that we put our hands to is going to prosper. Why? Because we're following the blueprint. We're following the guidelines. We're following the instructions. Give me the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 7. All of these are the blueprints and the directions and the guidelines to help us, to bring us back. The scriptures say in Baruch, did we finish that? Seek him 10 times more. Yes, sir. So we're trying to get back to what we've allowed to just mess up for centuries. We got to fight back hard now. The house is doggone falling on the ground. We got to go in there and rework the beams. Got to rework the floors, the walls, the wiring. We got to do all that work now because we've allowed it to just degrade over time. We've allowed our families to degrade over time. Now you can't even talk to your kids. Now you can't even talk to your sons and all that because they have been so wild for so long, they curse you out. But if we would have been able to deal with them, the moment they start to go off, we should have been right there to check them. But now that they got headstrong, the house then got headstrong in decay because we didn't keep, we didn't manage, we did not keep the upkeep. So you see the, you see the work that's ahead of us? Yes, sir. We got to work that much harder. But that's all right. God put it in us to do it, and we're going to get it done. Because what choice do we have? If we wake up now and realize, say, okay, I got to work 10 times harder. What choice do I have to not do it? If I continue to let, then it's going to be 100 times harder. Then I'm going to end up dead. There'll be no nation of Israel at all. So we have no choice. When the sense and the wisdom comes to you at that moment, that's the time to get involved. That's the time to make it happen. Read. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 7. Yes, sir. Only be thou strong and very courageous. Go ahead. That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Read. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. That's defiance. That's, that's no deviation. Okay. Read on. That thou mayest prosper. Whether that so we may what? Prosper. That we may be perfect and prosper. Everything that we put our hands to do when we follow this book, this Bible, that's when things are going to happen in the right order for us. And that's why there's such an effort for all of the nations to keep this Bible out of your hands. 
to keep this Bible out of your head because they know that this right here is the key. This is the oil that's going to make this engine work properly. Right. This is the timing chain that's going to organize the whole engine of the nation of Israel. Read. That thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Whithersoever thou goest. So when we here in IUIC, I'll just speak about us. We practice what, we, what we're reading. And this is the reason why the Most High is showing favor. But that doesn't mean that there's not enemies trying to topple this gospel. We are clearly aware of that. We know that there's enemies that's trying to stop this work. We understand that Negroes and all of them, they're all involved in it. This, it tells you about that in Acts. The people join with Pontius Pilate to try to destroy the nation of Israel. Okay, so we, un we understand that there's a, con there's a conglomerate, concerted effort by, by the nations as well as the wicked Israelites to try to destroy this gospel. We understand that. Read. This book of the law shall not depart of the out of thy mouth. This book of the law shall not depart out of our mouths. Go ahead. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. We shall meditate. That's being on guard so you can understand. Day and night, meaning, I listen, I got my hand on the spiritual trigger, so to speak, waiting on evil. I got to speak that way. I ain't, I'm not encouraging violence. I just want y'all to understand what I'm saying. You got to be like a man at war on guard all the time because there's always some kind of force that's trying to destroy you. That's warriors. That's what the most eyes talk about. Men, warriors. Read. Read that again. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Go ahead. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written that therein. We may, that we may do what is according to all that is written in the Bible. Go ahead. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. For at that time when you do that, you're not going to experience decades of destruction. You're not going to uh, have to endure centuries of neglect. If you paid attention... If we paid attention from the get very get-go, we would not be in this mess. It would be very easy to clean my house up because I only allowed it to go one day without cleaning. But now that the house has been sitting on the hill for, for 10 years, now i got to try to go in there and fix it. Uh, There's a little bit more. Yes, sir. Read the rest of it. And then thou shalt have good success. And then when we do this, when we take on this Bible and live by it, then we will have good success. And when we have good success, we're able to go into our communities. We're able to get our brothers off drugs. We have, we offer the, we are, we are able to get our sisters off of this promiscuous sleeping with everybody. We can get all that done when you can bring this Bible to them properly. That's how that happens. Tilt, like we read in Titus, set the people in order so we can learn how to take care of ourselves. And the Lord is going to be with us. It's not like Black Wall Street. The Lord wasn't with that. But the Lord is going to be with us. You feel me? So when we do it underneath the Most High, the Most High is going to protect us. You ain't going to be bombing us. The Most High is going to, when you put your hands on this nation here that's obeying God, hey, that's written in the scriptures. It said, listen, if they're following the Lord, you better leave them the hell alone. Because the God that hates iniquity is with them. And if they're keeping the commandments of God, you better leave them the hell alone. That's, that's what we need. That's where the success is going to come from. Don't let nobody tell you that this ain't worth trying. What the hell? We tried every damn thing else. Nothing worked. But leaving, we, we left our book on the side of the Bible and said, listen, open me up. He said, okay, the Lord said, okay, well, I'm going to make you open it up because I'm going to put so much affliction on you and then none of your gods are going to answer you. So now we're going to seek the Bible. And that's when you're going to wake up. And that's the reason why when, once you get in it, you stay in it. You don't bend. You don't get sidetracked. You don't get distracted. You don't get any of that stuff. You stay right here. Y'all hear me? Yeah. All praise to the Most High. So, with all that being said, we're going to move on. Now, let's see. Like I said, I'm talking more about our needing to be responsible today and exercising a particular defiance that will help bring us closer to our deliverance. That's the connotation of defiance that I want you all to understand. You all all right? So I want to just go through these, these definitions of defiance. We've got them on the board, right? 
Let's, de- let, let's deal with it. Let's go through that. To be defiant. To be defiant. Let's go through these things here. We're going to go, we're going to go a little bit more in detail with this defiant business. Okay. Uh, what we got there? Defiant definition. Full of or showing a disposition. Is that the first one? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Go ahead. This is the, this is the definition of defiant. I don't know why it's cut off, but, but it's okay. Go ahead. What does it say? Full of or showing a disposition to challenge. To challenge? Go ahead. Resist. Resist. Or fight. Fight against wickedness. To challenge wickedness. To resist wickedness. The scriptures say, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. So this is what we have to be defiant and fighting against evil spirits, fighting against wicked conversation, fighting against temptations on Facebook and, and YouTube and all this foolishness because they've used the platform in wickedness rather than righteousness. It's ridiculous. So we have to be full of or showing a disposition and attitude to challenge and resist or to fight against everything. Read on. Full of or showing defiance. Bold. We have to be bold in this. Go ahead. Impudent. Impudent. Unmovable. Therefore, they're called stubborn. Go ahead. Defiant rebels. Rebels. Had that word rebels again. We're, the rebels in this sense is being rebellious against evil. That's why I wanted to go through all that to make y'all understand that the connotation of defiance in this, re- in this respect is on the good side. Because we got a lot of work to do. Read it. I'm going to move it on up. Come on. A defiant refusal. A defiant refusal. Like they tried to get my brother Eliezer with the pork and the brothers in the, during the time of the Maccabees. He was defiantly. Eliezer, who was the other brother? I think I got it right, right? Eliezer. Huh? Come on. Read that again. Defiant During rebels. the time of the Maccabees. I'm get, go ahead. Defiant what? Defiant I'm rebels. I'm thinking of two different. Uh, situation. That's why I'm saying that. Read, read that again. Defiant what? Defiant rebels. Defiant rebels. He had to be a rebel. He had to be in rebellion to wickedness, and said, "I'd rather die than to than to betray the trust of my brothers to see me and think that I have gone off in some strange religion." Religion. Go ahead. A defiant refusal. A defiant refusal. Come on. Mantor struck a defiant pose. This is giving you an, exa- an example. Okay, we'll need that. Now, give me the next one. We're still dealing with defiant, right? Uh, here are some syn- synonyms. Go ahead. It says, does defiant mean disobey? Now, here we go. Here's the challenge. Does defiant means disobey in cases? Yes. And in cases, no, depending on what is, your, what is the obedience about. Is it about obeying God's law? We're not going to be defiant against that. That's why we read that in Proverbs earlier. The, 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 the nook of my sick says, I'm going to have a proud look against the Most High and hate my brothers. I'm going to and, and work my hands to shed innocent blood. What, did, what, was, what was the rest of that thing said in Proverbs? What did it say? It said uh, a lying tongue, sowing discord among brothers, all of that. You got to, you are in agreement. You ain't defiant. You're defiant against God. That's the proud look. The proud look in that respect is that you're being defiant against God. Read that again in Proverbs. You got it? Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16. Read. These six things doth the Lord hate. Go ahead. Yea, seven are an abomination unto Read. him. A seven are an abomination unto him. Come on. A proud look. A proud look. That's defiant. A proud look against God. That's defiant against God. That's not, the, that's not the defiance that we're talking about here. Y'all feel me? We're defiant against evil temptations, but we are in love with what God said. Okay, read. A lying tongue. A li- we are defiant against having a lying tongue. Go ahead. In hands that shed innocent blood. We are defiant in the current trend to encourage our people to shed each other's blood. The, Lord, the, the world loves to see us at odds with each other. Right. That's going to get accolades, YouTube views, and all types of madness. But that is against God. Read that statement again. In hands that shed innocent blood. Read. In heart that devises wicked imaginations. If you have a mind that devises wicked imaginations, you have a proud look, a defiant look against God. 
Because there, there was more about the Discord, right? Where's that Discord part at? Is it further down? Yes, read that. Verse 19, a false witness. A false witness. Do you hear this? That's against God to be a false witness. People know what the hell they saw. People know the results. The receipts have dropped. Huh. And all of a sudden, mum's the word. Nobody's saying nothing. A false witness. Had it been on the had it been the other way around, there'd have been all kinds of Spielberg four four hour videos, exposés, interviews. You've seen you seen how the nookers get down. Huh? You seen how they get down. Video after video, everybody's on it. Well, I want to do one too. I want to do one too. Be like nine, ten, fourteen videos. But then when righteous and the receipts drop, mum's the word. Nobody got nothing to say. And that kind of stuff emboldens a wicked person. Because his behind should have been corrected. The whole community would be like, yo, the receipts came out. You need to straighten that out. You need to repent. But that's showing you that the whole world is on crack. Read. A false witness that a, speaketh lies. A false witness that speaketh lies. Go ahead. And he that soweth discord among brethren. And he that soweth discord among brethren. That's what that kind of business will do. It is designed to destroy the progress of the nation of Israel. My goodness, man. That's where we're at now. Now, let's go back to where I was at, the, the definition here. We got more for you. We're we moving on. We're moving on. I got to move a little fast. I got a lot going on here. Deacon Abiel always getting on me, talking about a packet of information. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going to keep this thing moving. Uh, read. <laughs> I got some stuff for you, so I got to keep it moving. Come on. Does defiant mean disobey? Does, does defiant, does the word merely means disobey? Like I said, in a sense it does, and in another sense it doesn't. It depends on what is your allegiance and your, uh, your allegiance to uh, obedience is about. Go ahead. Argumentative and defiant behavior includes refusing to obey rules. Refusing to so argumentative and defiant behavior includes refusing to obey rules. If the rules are wrong, then you have to be defiant against it. Go ahead. Continually challenging authority. If the authority is not according to God's authority, then you have to be against that. Go ahead. Being deliberately annoying to others. We and have to be deliberately annoying to others if your objective is to uplift wickedness. Go ahead. Being deliberately annoying to others and slash or blaming others for mistakes or bad behavior. Or bad behavior. Uh, or blaming others for mistakes. Listen, do you hear that? Blaming others for mistakes or bad behavior. We got to be defiant against stuff like that, stuff like that. We cannot be in agreement with this. Y'all all right? So that level of defiance is proper. And, and what makes it proper? Because it is in the auspices and the order and the structure of God. That's the point. When I would, when I would, when I would defiance, the Lord said, who will stand up against me? I mean, who will stand up for me against the evildoers? This is what we are doing. The Lord says, I got you. You follow me. I got you. Okay? So now, moving on. So give me my next, give me my next slide. Read that. Is being defiant a good thing? Your defiant child's brain is healthy and thriving. Your, chi your, defiant, your defiant child's brain is healthy and thriving. There's a, there's, can, can any, do, do anybody see something uh, weird about this statement? Your defiant child, his brain is healthy and thriving. So what is his defiance about? Must be about something that is designed to make his brain not healthy and not thriving. So the question is, is being defiant a good thing? Read. Your child is understanding that she is separate from you. She is testing to understand boundaries and how the world works. She is learning how to express emotions and also how to self-regulate those big and intense feelings. So to, to, you might have to separate yourselves from things that are detrimental for you to that detrimental for you to develop your mind, to learn how to properly express your uh, emotions, to know how to self-regulate yourself. This is discipline. 
So it might take, a, it will take a level of defiance to make sure that you have these attributes working in your favor. Give me my next slide. Is your child, right? God. Now, read this. Now we're getting ready to turn it up a little bit. What are two synonyms for defiant? Okay. Aggressive. So the, these are negative connotations to what defiant is. The, the, uh, the synonyms for defiant is what they call aggressive. There's a time when you might need to be aggressive. Give me the book of Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes 3. Because there's a time when you might need to do this. There's a time to be aggressive. There's a time to be audacious. There's a time to be bold. There's a time to be challenging. There's a time to be contumacious. Uh, I had to look that word up. <laughs> There's a time to be daring. We got the definition. There's a time to be daring. There's a time to be gutsy. There's a time to be insolent. Y'all all right? <laughs> Come on, what we got? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1. To everything there is a season. There is a season. To everything there is a season. Go ahead. And a time to every purpose under the, under the, the heaven. Read. A time to be born. There is a time to be born. And a time to die. And a time to die. Go ahead. A time to plant. A time to plant. And a time to pluck. And a time to pluck up. Pluck up that which is planted. Read. A time to kill. A time to kill. And a time to heal. And a time to heal. And so in other words, if the season is not right, then these can be wrong. You feel me? There's a time when these things are proper. Whether it's a time to love, whether it's a time to hate. There's a time for when you do that. There's a time to plant, and there's a time to pluck up which has been planted. A time to heal, a time to kill. All of these are seasonal Things according to the Most High. So there's a time to be, I don't need no more of that. There's a time to be defiant, and then there's a time not to be defiant. There's a time when we have to be defiant if it's in dealing with wickedness. But then it is not a time to have a proud look and be defiant against our God. Y'all all right? Where you, where you are refusing God's correction. That's not the time for that. That's the time you're supposed to be in agreement. You're supposed to be in accord. That's how that goes. Now, move down. There's something else that I want to move. Go down, further down. I want, there was something right here. Is, defiant, is defiance a trait of ADHD? I'm about to turn it up. I'm about to go in a different direction now. Y'all all right? Is defiance a uh, byproduct of ADHD? Now, before I go into that, I just want to make this point about us being defiant. Like I said, there's a time to be defiant and there's a time not to be defiant. I'm going to make this statement. Then I'm going to read the scripture and I'm going to come back to this screen here. Okay? Uh, let me get them other two words, by the way. Um, that's that word there. Okay? Uh, I can't see that. Contu contumacious. That's the word. Contumacious. This is another, this is another uh, synonym for being defiant. Go ahead. Definition of contumacious, especially of a defendant's behavior. Stubbornly is sometimes it is proper to be stubborn. We got to be stubborn in keeping God's laws. Here's, here's an example. Sisters got fringes on their dresses. Brothers got fringes on their garments like the commandments command. You feel me? There is a time when you get around certain people that said, take them fringes off. You look this way, you look that way. That's the time to be stubborn. That's the time to be willfully disobedient to those who are trying to get you to break the laws of God. That's the time to be contumacious. I'm told I'm saying it right. Huh? Contumacious, I think that's how it's pronounced. Contumacious. That's the time to be contumacious. Y'all all right? That's the time to do that. When you, have to, when you have to exhibit a willful disobedience when it's in your disfavor or when it's to your detriment. Y'all all right? Okay. Now we got that understanding. What's the, what's the next one? Go back to those words again. Go back one. There was another word. We got consummations, right? Then it said daring. There's a time to be daring. There's a time to be gutsy. And then there's a time to be insolent. Let's look that word up. Insolent. 
showing a rude and arrogant lack of respect. What did, what did, when the people brought the madness to Paul, what did Paul say? Man, we ain't dealing with your mess for an hour. That was some disrespect right there. He said, I'm not entertaining none of that foolishness, not even for a second. Get the hell out of my face in a rude tone. Y'all all right? Yes, Tell them, shut up and listen. That kind of thing. Rude because you're standing on God. You hear me? That's the time to be insolent. So I'm just throwing those things out there, right? Impertinent, imprudent, stubborn again. So now let's go back to, uh, let's get the scriptures. We're going to the book of Ezekiel chapter 3. We're going to read about being insolent. Uh, we're going to read about being uh, stubborn. We're going to read about being defiant. We're getting ready to read it now. But before we do that, let me make this point. Our defiance against the unjust treatment has caused us to be labeled a hate group. Think about that. You're a hate group. Lies. We don't hate anybody. You feel me? The Bible says, if at all possible, live at peace with all men. And we literally mean that. We try our best to live at peace with all men. That's not hate group speech. That's not hate speech. That's the Bible. But because our teaching is about cleaning you up, which is what the nations are benefiting from your destruction. They say, well, you're teaching, you're trying to remove my slaves from me and you're trying to uplift them. Therefore, you are a hate group. You are a wolf. That's how they, that's how they perceive us because we are, fix, we are making it so that they can't use you anymore. Huh? Shoot. Read. I mean, uh, let me make my point. So our defiance against unjust treatment has caused us to be labeled a hate group because we refuse to allow ourselves to remain in decadence. So in this sense, our defiance or contumaciousness <laughs> and our insolence should not be frowned upon as attributes of a hate group because we are not a hate group, but we do exercise the discipline that these adjectives build in our mind and our minds and spirit that produces hard, unyielding minds against the evils that we today suffer from. Y'all all right? That's the point there. Now, give me the book of Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 1. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 1. This is the reason why we have to be insolent and, and, and the mother words that we read earlier. Y'all all right? Come on. Read. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest. So, son of man, all of us represent Ezekiel. All of us men represent Ezekiel. Follow me now. Read it again. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, eat that thou findest. Eat this roll. The roll is the Bible. This is the roll, the scrolls, the records of our fathers. Read. And go speak unto the house of Israel. So once you eat it, meaning eat it in your mind, now you have it in your spirit. Now you can go out and teach your people. How in the world are you going to have camp and not resurrect your people when you see the problem out here? You get on a corner and you talk about another camp. Where, what about the people in front of you? That's what you call empty. That's a shame. I feel bad for those brothers. I'm saying I'm not here to make fun of them. I know they're mad and pissed off at me and all of them. That's okay. They hated Christ too. They hated the disciples. My objective is that you brothers get your minds right and repent. Right. Get your spirit right. Okay. Uh, read. Read that again. Eat this roll. Eat this roll. Go ahead. And, and go speak unto the house of Israel. And go speak to the Israelites that need to hear this Bible. Go ahead. So I opened my mouth. So I opened my mind and studied like the bishop tells us when this is instructions. Study, pray, and apply. Go ahead. And he caused me to eat that roll. And he caused me to eat the Bible, meaning understand it, read it, and study it. Go ahead. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat. Cause thy belly to eat. Now, it's getting ready to get deep now. And when you first learn the Bible, you're reading it, and you, you, you're able to recite it. You're able to quote it. Like some of the kids, you know, they can quote certain scriptures. Like when you first start learning, you rem you're memorizing it, but it's not fully in you yet. Follow me and how are we breaking this down. Read it again. Read that statement again. And he said unto me, son of man, 
Cause thy belly to eat. Cause thy be- so first of all, it said eat this roll. So you ate it in your mind. You read it. You studied it. And it's here. You can memorize it. But then it says cause thy belly to eat. So now you're digesting it. What is that talking about? You're now you're going through the trials. As, you, as you're digesting it, now the information that's in the Bible is starting to manifest itself through your actions, and people are seeing the change that the Bible is causing you, and it's bringing you afflictions. Your family members, your wife, you know, world, your wife in the world, or husband in the world, those kinds of things. Now you get, now, now the persecution starts coming. Why? Because now you're digesting it. Read that statement again. And he said unto me, son of man, cause thy belly to eat. Cause thy belly to eat. And fill thy ba- bowels with this roll. Fill and- thy bowels. Now it's all, now it's being exercised in your clothing, your dress, your eats, your ab- your speech. Everything is changed because it's now, it's coming out of every, es- every aspect of you. It ain't just memory. When you just first ate it in your mind, you swallowed it. Now it's in you. It's hip talk. It's in you. And now you're starting to change. And as you're changing, people are noticing it. They say, why are you not running with us to the same excessive ride that we used to do earlier? You're not doing that anymore because it's now it's in you. Now it's starting to change you. You're no longer a Negro with a Bible. <laughs> now the Bible is starting to shine through you. Let your light shine. Okay. Then it says, it says, uh, and fill thy bowels with this roll. Now it's in all of your actions. You follow me? It's not only in your forehead, but it's in your hands as well. That's the mark that the Bible's talking about. Now it's in your hands. Now you're actually operating and doing what the Bible says. Read. And fill thy bowels with this roll that I, that I give thee. That I give thee. Come on. Then did I eat it. Then did I eat it. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. It was in my mouth. as I'm the Jews. I'm Israel. I got a kingdom coming. The Jews are black. My brothers are not my enemies. You're learning that, and you're happy to share it with everybody. When you brothers started learning this with the first minute together, you wanted to challenge everybody because it was sweet. <laughs> you couldn't wait. You went to the job, bl- blasted everybody because you was happy because it was sweet. Man, I found out this truth, and all of a sudden, now you're fired. Oh, shit. You want to put the fringes on? Can't wear that. <laughs> Bam. Read that again. Then did I eat it. Then did I eat it. And it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. It was in my mouth as honey as sweetness. So it was sweet in his mouth. Now, I want, to, I want to transcend from this. Go to the book of Revelation. I want to get the rest of the statement here. Because John went through the same thing. The apostle John on the island of Patmos. Uh, I forget the scripture. Why am I forgetting the scripture? Is it the tenth chapter? It's, it's, it's use the word roll again. Yes, come on, somebody help me out. I'm not looking at it because I want to segue from this because I'm coming back to this with John. Huh? Ten and nine. Thank you. Revela- start with eight. Start with eight verse. Revelations chapter ten and verse eight. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again. So remember what we just read in Ezekiel, right? Read that again. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel. That's the role that we read in Ezekiel. Go ahead. Which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. Go ahead. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. Give me that roll. Go ahead. And he said unto me, take it. And take eat. it, meaning study it. Put it in your mind. Go ahead. Take it and eat it up. And it, eat it up. Listen. And it shall make thy belly bitter. And it shall make thy belly bitter. Because you're going to get persecuted. You got to stand up against the wickedness. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers when you take this book in? Why do you think people, I, I was looking at some of the, some of the uh, correspondence this morning. Man, you got a lot of people that, that hates IUIC right now. Huh? Because of this. If we all put this Bible down and became nookers, we would all be in love again. We'd be called cool in the game. But because we got this Bible, everybody got something to say. That's all right. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. <laughs> 
Hey, read that again. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly, belly bitter. And it shall make thy belly bitter. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as That's honey. That's the part that I needed there. But when, but when you first put it in you, it was sweet. Read that verse again. And I went unto the angel and, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter. It shall, when you fully digest it and you begin to manifest what's in this Bible in your bowels, meaning in your whole actions and everything about you. When people really see that, that I am in you, it's going to be bitter because people are going to hate you for this. You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. But when you first get it, it was sweetness. Read the rest of it. But it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. It, when, something that is digested hits your tongue first before you can digest it. So when you first get it, it's sweet. That's what we was reading in Ezekiel. But after you digest it, then you begin to get the nutrients from what you ate. You ain't not getting the nutrients as soon as it hits your tongue. But it's sweet. But once you digest it, then the nutrients begin to manifest through your body. People can see how healthy you are when you change your diet. That's what this is talking about. The diet is the Bible. Now the Bible is being shown in your parts. I can see your strength and all of that. And because of that, you are hated, and that's where the bitterness comes in at. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Go back to Ezekiel. Thank you, brothers. Go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the verse 3. Ezekiel. Ezekiel, chapter 3, in verse 3. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for it sweetness. It was in my mouth, honey as sweetness. Now the bitterness is coming later on in the chapter, so you can see crystal clear that what we've been reading is proper. We're going to read the bitterness now, because it didn't use the word bitter here. It gave you bitter in Revelation, but we're about to read bitter because he digested it. Read. And he said unto me, son of man, go, get thee unto the house of Israel. Go, get thee to the house of Israel because now it's in your bowels now. Now it's all throughout your body. Now you got to go to the rebellious of Israel. You got to go to your rebellious home, some of us. You got to go to the rebellious husband, the rebellious wife, all that. Because now you're challenged to deal with this Bible now. Read. And speak with my words unto them. And speak with my words unto them. Unto them. Go ahead. For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech. The Most High is sending us to our people. So when we go to the ghettos, when we go to the neighborhoods, when we go to where the brothers and sisters have lost hope and all of that, we're going to them. And they are hardwired into evil. We have to go and change their minds. Go ahead. And of an hard language. They're not of a hard language. We all speak the same language. That's the reason why the Most High, the Most High takes you from that very community, educates you, then brings you back to help your brothers, to help your sisters. That's why I say, you know, hard language. He's sending us to our own people. The brothers that's overseas dealing with brothers that speak Dutch, the people live there. They can speak that. Speaking to all the different languages and all that, y'all seen the, the different videos when we out traveling the world, teaching our people. The people that's teaching them live there. So they're not sent to a people of a hard language and a hard speech. The Most High endowed them with this Bible as well so that they can go back and clean their people up as well. The beauty of the Most High's work. Give the Lord a hand for that thing. I got to do it, man. Ain't no, ain't no stopping this truth. Ain't no stopping this truth. Read on. But to the house of Israel. He sent us to the house of Israel. Not of people of a different language. Here you coming up talking about somebody speaking Hebrew. Nobody the hell know what the hell you're talking about. Madness. <laughs> people ain't reading the Bible. That's what that's, that's, what that's proving. Read. Not too many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand. We are not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language whose words thou cannot understand, because that's confusion. We was taught in the old school, I remember the elders would say, 
When you go teach the Bible, teach the words that's in the Bible. Teach, I mean, literally, word for it. He said, you got to, because when the people go home and read it, they're not going to read the hour. They're not going to read those words in there. I mean, we say it every now and then. We ain't got no problem with it. But in terms of edifying the people, you got to give them the words that's in the book. So when they go home and look at it, they're like, yes, that's what he said. This is what it's talking about. Read. Surely had I sent them to them. Surely had I sent you to the other nations. They this would is showing how rebellious we are. Go ahead. Surely, they would if this gospel was for the Edomites, if this gospel was for the Arabs, if it was for the Chinese, the Japanese, and all, if it was for them, surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. They would have hearkened unto thee. They would have hearkened unto these words so bad that they're trying to follow their own thing to have some kind of order. Just look at it. They don't have the Bible, but even, with, even without the Bible, they show more organization than we do. Think about that. Just imagine if they had this. They done lied on it in America with this Christianity God, but they stone cold lied on it, put a so-called white Christ and all that, and said that this was their book. That's how much they want to be in this. But here's the Bible. The Bible is for our people. We don't want it. Read. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee. But the true Israelites will not listen. Go ahead. For they will not hearken unto me. This is that hardness that, that my brothers is going through. This is, this is the, uh, the bitterness that we are experiencing when we deal with our people. Go ahead. For all the house of Israel are impotent and hard-hearted. Are impudent and hard-hearted. Stupid. Hard-headed. Unbending in the wrong direction. If you're going to be imputed, be imputed for God's laws. But our people are, are stiff-necked, hard-headed against the Bible. They're defiant against the Bible. These are the same words that we're reading in the definitions. Read. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces. This is where the discipline comes in. The scriptures say, behold, I have made, your, I have made thy face strong against their faces. This is that unyielding, bending. This is that, this is that, this is that uh, discipline, straight, down the road mindset that's not going to be bent for nobody. Go ahead. In thy that's why I, I love what Bishop said. Why, he said this many years ago. He said, no, regardless of what anybody try to do, we will not be deterred from this gospel. We will not be deterred from pushing this gospel to the four corners of the planet Earth. We will not be stopped. We will not be discouraged. We will not be stopped at all. You could drop dead if you think this gospel is going to stop. Right. That's the kind of mind you have to have. And that's the reason why we fight the way we fight. That's the reason why we're unyielding with the way we, un the way we roll and when we train. That's the reason why we're that way, because we are straight up serious. You say, well, damn, what you going to do with a nickel like that? <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. You think about your other brother, right? Come on, read. You about to take me somewhere else. <laughs> read. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces. I have made, uh, the most I say he has made, our face meaning our mind. That's what it's talking about. Your brain, your mind, the repentant mind. Once we repent, once the, once the, once the tenets of that Bible has manifested itself in our movement, in our action, in our speech, in our dress, in our diet, in our conversations, in our actions, in our organization, once all of that happens, we are not to be moved at all. I heard, I heard Heyman say that, that, that IUIC, and I'll speak about us because we are IUIC, right? Yes, sir. He said that the Israel United in Christ is ruthless in terms of their rules and doctrinal purity, in terms of meaning in setting up order. They said we will, and we've done it. We will shut whole camps down if they deviate from the rule that we have set up according to this Bible. There will be no more school there if they're going to go outside of the order because we mean business. And what business do we mean? God's business. Read. In thy forehead, strong against their forehead. And our foreheads, meaning our minds, our unyielding, unbending, uncompromising of God's laws. That's in our mind. And our minds got to be what? Strong against their forehead. Our foreheads got to be strong against all everybody else's forehead. So Christianity, all of let me give you an example. Give me that in uh, Corinthians. 
Give me that uh, uh, pulling down the imaginations. That's what it's talking about. Casting down imaginations. Our forehead have to be strong against their foreheads. That's what it's talking about. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Mm -hmm. What's the four verse Verse say? four. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That's a good point to start. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is the weapons? God's commandments. The weapons is God's commandment because these things work on that head. You're trying to act like it don't work. It work on you. You will be convicted by the words of God. Read that again. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. For the weapons of our warfare. Of our what? Of what? our warfare. Is that what it say? For, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Warfare is war. For the weapons of our warfare. This is a spiritual war that we are in. Warring in defiance to establish God's kingdom. Read that again. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. These are not carnal weapons, but they are spiritual weapons that work on that head. Go ahead. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So our foreheads have to be stronger than your forehead to hold to uphold wickedness, to uphold Christianity, to uphold Islam, African, whatever it is. Your, your forehead is mush compared to our foreheads when it comes to establishing this gospel. That's what it's saying. Defiant in structured discipline, ordered discipline. Read. Casting down imagination. Casting down lies. Casting down imaginations. Come on. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Every high thing, lies, slander, evil, whatever it is, if it's not according to the God's Bible, it gets cast down. That's where our foreheads are. That's where our minds are. That's how we are when we teach. That's how we have to be because we cannot go backwards. We've got to go forward. Okay? Is that it on that? And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Meaning our forehead got to be hard enough to break all these ideologies and all of that down to the bottom. Bring it into captivity up underneath the commandments of God. That's the warrior code. Is that it? Yes, sir. Now, let's go back to where he was at. Ezekiel chapter 3 and verse 9. As an adamant harder than flint. That's how our minds got to be. As an adamant that's harder than a flint rock. Hard-headed. Stubborn. Impudent. That's, that's where those adjectives come in at. Impertinent. Go ahead. As an adamant harder than flint. Have As I, an adamant harder than flint. Come on. Have I made thy forehead? Have I made your mind? The mind that God put in us in repentance is not to be bent. It's not to be compromised. It's not to be laid down and given evil an opening. No. Not even for a second. Go ahead. Fear them not. Fear them not. Because they're going to trump. They're going to come with threats. That's the bitterness that we was talking about earlier. Go ahead. Fear them not. Go ahead. Neither be dismayed at their looks. Neither be dismayed at their doggone looks trying to look tough. The hell with you. Neither be dismayed at their looks. Though, th though they be a rebellious house. Though they be rebellious as hell and they ask going to die for their damn rebellion. Go ahead. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, all my words that I shall. You got to know that too. When you're dealing and you got some rebellious cat, you stand on this and know that there's a judgment. Because that's I, 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 I would say it often. I say every word that you nookers are saying, you're going to pay for that. You're going to pay for that. And, I, and I'm resolved in that understanding. Go ahead. Read. Moreover, he said unto me, son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thy heart. And hear with thy ears, and go, get thee to them of the captivity unto the children of thy people. So the Most High told us to take this truth and go to the people, go to your people and do what? And speak unto them, and tell them, thus saith the Lord God. And tell them, thus saith the Bible. That's the role that Ezekiel had to eat, 
That's the role that John had to eat and prophesy again among many nations and countries. That's what Revelation was going to tell you. We kept reading. Come on. Whether they will hear. Whether you hear the word of God. Or whether they will forbear. Or whether you say to hell with it. That's not our problem. We're going to give you this word. And whether you take it or whether you, we're telling you to repent of your evil and lies. You can, you can shake your hand at it, obfuscate and act like we didn't say nothing. You're going to pay for that. The only thing we're going to do is tell you what the scriptures say. And then we just leave you be. That's it. Because the blood is off our hands. Right. If we leave you in evil and don't correct you, then we're going to be charged for it. But once we tell you where you're breaking God's laws and, and you decide to not repent and you decide to not get your mind right and, and, and correct the evil, the blood is off our hands. When your head gets chopped off by the Most High, that will be on you. That won't be on us. The blood might splatter on you a little bit, but don't worry about that. <laughs> Y'all all right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Lord have mercy. The Bible has the solution to our people's problems. Give me Isaiah, the 28th chapter. Isaiah 28, verse 7. This is the refreshing after the lies of Christianity. Because Christianity has messed our minds up to this day. And now here comes the refreshing to remove you out of that messed up mind state so that you too can be defiant in keeping God's commandments so you can be defiant and be in discipline and in order to be upstanding women and upstanding men to follow the dictates of this Bible and yes I did I use the right word the dictates of this Bible there ain't no choice it's, this is a dictatorship read Isaiah Chapter 28 and verse 7. But they also have erred through wine. Our people have erred in churches. That's the lies. Go ahead. And through strong drink. And through strong drink. Christianity mainly. The apologetics and all that madness. Go ahead. Are out of the way. Are out of the way. Our people are lost. Go ahead. The priests and the prophets have erred through strong drink. The priests and the prophets that's in these Christian churches have lied to the people. And caused them to be all messed up. Read. They are swallowed up of wine. They are swallowed up in the Christianity. Go ahead. They are out of the way through strong drink. Read. They are in vision. They can't see straight. They have no vision at all. They think they have generations of people sitting in church never going anywhere. Go ahead. They stumble in judgment. They stumble in the commandments. They, stumble, they don't even know how to judge matters. You got adultery, fornication, all types of stuff going on in the, in the, in the congregation, and nobody knows how to judge it. Go ahead. For all tables are, are full of vomit. That's how the people are going to perceive it. Tables mean in the Bible. The, in other words, the Bible ain't helping them. All tables are full of vomit. In other words, their Bibles and their churches don't mean nothing to them. Mm. It might as well be vomit. Go ahead. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. Whom shall he teach? So they can't even figure, they don't even know where the solutions to our people's problems at. They're basically just using the Bible to hold up the, the, the crooked dresser <laughs> or put it on the dashboard thinking you're not going to get a ticket. Huh? Open it up to the Psalms like Deacon Asaph say, right? <laughs> Read. Where you at? Verse 9. Read. Verse, uh, Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Whom shall the Lord teach his knowledge to? And whom will the Lord make to understand his doctrine? Go ahead. Them that are weaned from the milk. You got to be studying the Bible. Those that are weaned from the milk. Go ahead. And drawn from the breast. And drawn from the breast. That's the hip talk. This Bible. This is the milk. That's why it says that in Peter's. That ye may grow thereby as newborn babes. Desire the sincere milk of the breast, meaning of the Bible, that you may grow by the breast that comes from this Bible. That's how it gets from your sweet mouth into your full manifestation of your actions. Because now it's in you. Go ahead. For precept must be upon precept. This is how it works. The scriptures come together. When you're going all over the Bible, painting the picture properly. You got a nooker that's saying that that ain't, help, that ain't what that means. The hell with you and your mama. We ain't bending down for nothing. We mean what this Bible saying. That's what we're going to do. Right. Read. For precepts. No, I shouldn't be so doggone vulgar. I'm sorry. I shouldn't Bring say it that. Out. I shouldn't say it. I hope, hope, hope the brother and his mama repent. <laughs> Read. 
For precept must be upon precept. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Got to put upon the precepts together to paint the picture. Go ahead. Line upon line. The most High made it that way. That's the reason why he wrote it the way he wrote it. He gave Isaiah some information, Jeremiah some information. He put it that way because he did not want everybody figuring it out. Think about that. Think about that. This Bible has traveled all these years and it got into the right hands. And we, didn't, we got the keys to go inside this Bible and unlock all the problems and fix our people. Boy, I tell you, the Most High is beautiful. Right. So we got it the right way. Read. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. And there a little. Here a little and there a little. Go ahead. For with stammering lips and another tongue. Listen to this part here. For with stammering lips and another tongue. Well, and another hold it. What are stammering lips? Lips that are outside of the original lips, which is the Hebrew writing, Hebrew language. Y'all all right? Stammering meaning that you're not speaking the proper, you're not speaking the language that the, that the scrolls was originally written in. It was written in Hebrew. You can, when you go to the book, let me just say this real quick, just, just because. In the book of Genesis, give me that real quick. Give me the, give me the book of Genesis chapter 11. We're we coming back here. I'm just sidebarring for a second. Not that I needed to do it, but I just want to do it just to. Make it clear, make it crystal clear of what we read. Uh, Genesis 11, verse 1. Read. Genesis chapter 11 and verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. What did that mean? Well, what language was it? That's the next, that's the next question. It was of one language and it was of one speech, meaning the language was Hebrew. We're going to prove that. And then it says, out of one speech, meaning of this, it wasn't no tomato, tomato. Everybody spoke the Hebrew the same way. That's what that's saying. Now, let's prove the language. Go to, uh, give me about Abraham, where it says, one that escaped. Well, you know what? I need something before that. Give me about uh, Peleg, Jockton and Peleg. Jockton and Peleg. You know what I'm talking about? Look, go in the 10th chapter. Go in the 10th chapter. Go in the 10th. Yeah, that might be it. I'm not looking. I'm just trying to go off memory. About Sala. You see it? S-E-L-A-H. That was the father. Sala had, you found it? What's the verse? Come on. Help me out, brothers. Was it 24? Read that. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 24. And our facts, our facts had right. Our, our facts had begot Selah. Uh, our facts had begot Selah. Go ahead. And Selah begot Eber. And 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 what? And and, and Selah begot Eber. And Salah begot Eber. Eber. That name Eber is Hebrew. That's where the name Hebrew comes from. That's why it's saying that Eber. Eber is Hebrew. Okay. That's. That's his, that his name was called Hebrew. Why did Salah name his son Eber? Because when the Most High was going to divide all of the languages up, he named his son, uh, he named his son Eber in reference to the language of the past. That's what the word means. Eber means from the past. That's what it means. The language that everybody spoke in the past, that's the language that was going to continue through Eber's line. Abraham came out of that line. That's the reason why it called Abraham the Hebrew. Find that scripture. That's why I said it that way. Uh, 14, 13, something like the 13, 14. Read that. You got it? Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, lift up now thy eyes. Yeah, 14, 13. Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13. And there came one that had escaped. Listen. And told Abram the Hebrew. Told who? Abram the Hebrew. Why? Told Abram the Hebrew. Why was he called the Hebrew? Because he came out of the line of Eber. Our facts had all that. They all was the Hebrew speaking people. So Eber, out of Eber's line came Abraham. That's why he was called Abram the Hebrew. So what the hell would Ishmael be speaking? Hebrew. They all would be speaking that because they came out of, out of Abraham's line. Talking about some damn 
Arabic. Aramaic. Stupid as hell. Go go back to where I was at before. Uh, with Joktan and Pele. Right? That's where he was at. Just bear with me, brothers and sisters. What was it? Where was we at? I'm not looking. I'm just trying to go off memory. Genesis what? No, no, no. Genesis 10. Genesis 10 and what? Read that. That's what I need. Genesis chapter 10 and verse. And then we're coming back to where we, where we, uh, ten, where we deviated from in Isaiah. Read. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 25. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. The, the name of one was Peleg. The name of the, the it says, and of Eber was born what? Two sons. Was born two sons. Listen. The name of one was Peleg. The name of one of the sons of Eber was Peleg. Go ahead. For in his days was the earth divided. Well, for in his days in Peleg, because Peleg means division. In Peleg's days, the earth, meaning the languages, was divided. So the people that stayed on Eber's side kept the Hebrew language. Okay? And that's how the records was written. The Israelites. Y'all all right? Everybody understand that? So now let's go back to Isaiah. Thank you. Thank you. We, we can drop all that. Let's go back to where we was at. The scripture. Yes, sir. Isaiah chapter 28. In verse 11, mm -hmm. for with stammering lips in another tongue. For with stammering lips, lips that are outside of the Hebrew language. Go ahead. Well, and, another, and another tongue. I want both of that. For and another tongue. Read it again. I'm breaking it down. I'm breaking it down. There's two parts to that verse you're reading. Read it again. For with stammering lips. For with stammering lips. Stop right there. For with stammering lips, meaning lips outside of Hebrew. Go ahead. And another tongue. And another language. That's where we're at now. And another language. Meaning English, meaning Creole, Spanish, German, Dutch, Swahili. That's what it's talking about. And another language. Go ahead. In another tongue will he speak unto this people. Will the Most High speak to his people in these languages? Y'all getting this? Y'all understand? Read on. To whom he said... This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. So when we go to these countries and we speak the language that where the people can understand it, we, this is not a hard language that we were talking about earlier. We're going to be speaking a language that where the people's ready to receive it. And when we give it to them, it's saying that what? Read that again. To, to, whom, he, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. So when we, when, we, when we read these overseas and in these different countries, we read this in the language that they're speaking. I don't know what the hell they're saying, but the brothers over there, they know what, and the people respond to it. You get it? Because that's the point. Read. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Yet a lot of our people don't want to hear, even though the Most High made it easy for you to understand. He didn't give it to us in a hard language. He gave it to us in the language that we understand. And yet our people are still rebellious. Read. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Meaning that they're in the Bible. The curses are still on them. But the word of the Most High, in other words, we can read about the nookers in here. Go ahead. Line upon line. Line upon line. Line upon line. Read. Here a little and there a little. Here a little and there a little. Deuteronomy the 28, the Leviticus, Revelation, Isaiah, all that. We read about our people. Go ahead. That they might go and fall backward. And the most are going to trap them up because of their rebelliousness. And some of our people are so rebellious, they're going to justify evil. He, he that justifieth the wicked and condemneth the just. Both of those are an abomination unto the Lord. So here you are, here you're justifying lies and slander and evil, and you're condemning the commandments that correct you. Both of those, both of those actions are an abomination unto the Lord. Read, read that again. They said, but that, that they might go. That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. And taken. That's what the Most High is going to call strong delusion. That will cause them to a believe a lie. That's what Thessalonians is talking about. He's going to bind them up and cause the Bible to be a trap unto them. Talking about Israelites that's claiming to hold the Bible and all that and breaking the laws of the Most High. won't repent at all. The Most High is going to say, okay, you're going to continue to believe that. 
You, you got the truth. You go ahead. You go ahead with it. And most of us say, I'm going to jam your mind up and make you think that you're proper. Ain't that something? That's what that statement means. He said, and fall backwards and be broken, snared, and taken. That's some scary stuff right there, ain't it? Yes, sir. Give me that in, in Second Thessalonians real quick so we can just prove, prove my statement. Second Thessalonians 2 and, uh, no, start with the 10th verse. Read. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth. They did not love the correction. They did not love the instruction. They did not, re they did not love the reproof. Go ahead. That they might be saved. That they might repent and be saved. They, they, they hated all of that. Here you got people talking about something. I'm not going to wear fringes because IUIC will wear fringes. But we put that, but a lot, lot of us, a lot of, everybody pretty much knows that it was Bishop that went through his closet and filmed all of his clothing with the fringes on it. Everybody, I mean, that was many years ago. And you saw, and all praise to the Most High. And brothers and sisters recognized that and said, you know what? Forget about who came up with it. Is that a law in the Bible? Yes. Nukas. Look at that and say, well, I can't do it because he, because he brought it out. And you sick enough to actually believe that that's going to have you get delivered. That's the, ain't nobody going to be like, oh, you following Nathaniel's or you following. The, that's the law in the Bible. That's got nothing to do with us. But you were so rebellious and so defiant against what the Lord said, I don't want to even give you any kind of credit to say that we got it from you or something. That's some, read the thing, man. I'm. I'm say, I say I'm not going to go into the abyss, and I'm not. I still haven't done it. I'm just, I'm, hey, like I said, when I teach, I'm teaching all of y'all for y'all not to follow these examples. This is, these airwaves and this time slot is dedicated to the education of the most highest people through repentance, and that's what I'm bringing you. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Read. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 11. And for this cause, God should send them strong delusion. That they should believe a lie. That they should believe a lie. That our people shall believe a lie. You will believe that you are correct when you are wrong as hell. That's some scary stuff, ain't it, brothers and sisters? To end up in a reprobate state of mind is a scary thing. You'll think you're rolling with the truth and you are so far to the left. It's unbelievable. Because your hatred has blinded you so badly that you will refuse to keep the commandments of God just because you think that they came from us. That's, that's some real sickness. A Deacon Asaph made the point last night. He said, if anybody else would have came up with that, we'd have read that. We'd have been like, oh, okay, all praise to the most high. We're going to do that. Easy. Easy. Mm, 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 mm. There's some scary stuff. Um, go back to my, no, is that it? Okay, now, let, let, I'm about to go back to my topic of discussion. Y'all all right? Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, give, me, is, give me Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 32, verse 17. I got to read this because we were talking about those who refuse, who refuse correction. Let's read that. Sirach 32, verse 17. Sirach chapter 32 and verse 17. A sinful man will not be reproved. That's what we was reading in uh, 2 Thessalonians. A sinful man will not be reproved. He don't want to hear correction. She don't want to hear correction. And they will, go ahead, read the rest of it. But find if an excuse according to his will. Try to sway everybody to look away from the actual sin and try to trump up all kinds of, in, try to come up with all kinds of, other things to make you forget the real reason why we're here in the first place. Because you lied. Because you lied. And you told everybody to lie. And then when the receipts came out, the lies were proven. And instead of you allowing the correction to work on you, you tried to pull up articles, all kind of stuff. To get you away from what the correction was about. That's some serious delusion. I pray that the brothers get their mind. There's no hatred there. I pray that the brothers get their mind together. That's my prayer. That's our prayer. Read. A sinful man will not be reproved, but findeth an excuse. But findeth an excuse. 
Go ahead. According to his will. According to his agenda. That's not God's agenda. According to his agenda. He will find an excuse according to his own agenda rather than what God said. That's what a sinful man would do. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. So there ain't no escape in that thing. The only escape is repentance. Period. Now, moving on. Go back to my screenshot about the ADHD. Now, you see that at the bottom? Zoom in on that. Come down at the bottom. Uh, the, I'm going back to the community now. Is defiance a trait of ADHD? What is defiant behavior in adults? I didn't really want that. But then it says, is defiance a symptom of ADHD? Now, many of our kids, I'm going to come off of this for a second. Um, ADHD, what they call it, uh, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, right? They say that about our kids, our sons that is, that's, that's in the schools and all of that. And they say that our kids, they, they try to say that our kids can't learn and all that other kind of stuff. And then they put them in special ed. And they put them in situations where they end up shunting them into a penal system where they end up going from the school to prison. All by design, right? We, as the watchmen, have to understand that. That's the reason why we have to organize, do the things that we can do. Make sure that we educate our children. Make sure that we deal with our children so that they don't lose hope, so that they don't lose aspiration. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make mention of something. Um, go to my pictures. Yes, sir. Show that. Show this here. Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. This was a book that was written by this brother named Jawanza Kanjufu, okay? Black man. Uh, he wrote this book, Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. And the point that he's making about black, the reason why the conspiracy is against black boys, because without black... If you destroy the black boys, you don't have to worry about trying to destroy them as a man. And if there are no men, the women have no one to really marry. So now they're out here vulnerable with no male protection or nothing. This is a, this is a big problem. But it's a systematic thing of what they've done to our sons, okay, in these schools. Open up the book. Zoom in. Y'all heard me talk about this many times before about what's known as the fourth grade failure syndrome. Just right there. Okay? Read that real quick. I don't want to go through all of this. Um, since 19... Read it, read it, read it. Fourth grade failure syndrome. Now, I'm dealing with the ADHD thing. That's what I'm talking about now. And why am I bringing this up? Because this is also another part of our work. We have to deal with these brothers because if we don't intercept them from getting destroyed in school, they're going to end up in criminal activity. They're going to end up selling drugs. They're going to end up raping and robbing and, be, and becoming property of the state. You hear what I'm saying? Read. Since 1974, I have been a national consultant to public and private schools, ranging from preschool through college. My responsibilities are to conduct workshops for teachers and parents and to provide cultural assembly programs for children. It was during my travels that I recognized the conspiracy, often so subtle. He recognized the conspiracy. It also, all, what does it say? Often so subtle. All, often so subtle. Often so subtle. Now, uh, let me see where you at. Read on. Often so subtle. Go ahead. Often so subtle mentioned previously. Let me first begin with the innocence of black boys who bring enthusiasm to the classroom. Trust their teachers and are willing to please. And are willing to please. Many of your young sons, when your sons went to school, they were exuberant, smart, brilliant. In the same book, it talks about one of the kids, I forget his name, and they said that when he was in, the, in, in, those, in those first grades, in those first few grades, the IQ test of this one black boy, because there's many of them, his intelligence was in the 98% percentile of the whole country, basically a walking genius. But by the time he got to the fourth grade, apathy had set in. He had lost interest and paid more attention to his dump truck and his football, those kinds of things there. Why did that happen? 
because the teachers began to not not pull expectations from them. We are full of we our kids are they want they are enthusiastic about going to school. They are enthusiastic about learning. That's our people. We are enthusiastic about things. But if there is no expectation from the teacher, if there's no expectation from the people that's in front of them, the persons will be like raising their hand and nobody's ever calling on them. What's going to happen after a while? He will stop raising his hand. He will stop volunteering. And he will just let his exuberance go to waste. That's what happens. Y'all hear me? This is what happens. Now, as I mentioned this, because uh, the brother said here, he said often, he said, he said during, he said, I was during, it was during my travels that I recognized the, the conspiracy, conspiracy. Often, often so subtle. That's the part that I want. Often so subtle. Now, I used to watch the Donahue program. I'm about to bring up something, right? I remember watching an episode of Donahue, Fuel Donahue in New York. I'm a, I'm, maybe some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, Phil Donahue. How many of y'all know who, who I'm talking about? Okay. Phil Donahue. I was watching one of his episodes. And I don't remember, I don't exactly remember what episode it was. I wrote this because I wanted to make sure I said it right. But it has something to do with black women and black men not really working together or getting along. So that was always controversial. Everybody, the ratings and all that, everybody's always interested in seeing black men and black women fight such and such. Just like seeing Israelites fight. It's crazy. But our people are drawn to that. That's ratings. That's really that's, that's sickening that I'm saying that. That's ratings. All of a sudden, you get notoriety because of some niggerdom. But here's the same thing that was happening back in. Uh, points were being made that black men and black women were not really getting along, and that was advertised, and boom, they get their view, viewers. So there's Donahue getting his ratings up, as somebody uh, might have pointed out on the program. But on this program... It's, uh, there was a teacher in the New York City public school system who stood up and he was speaking about teacher expectations, which is what we're talking about here, right? Y'all all right? Okay. Uh, about teacher expectations, okay? Um, which, leads to the, which leads to the majority of black men not being able to later earn a suitable living to support these black women. Because that's what the program was about. A lot of the black women that's in the audience, and they're hearing this, and they're thinking to themselves, well, when, I, when my daughters get old enough, who are they going to marry? Because the this, this, this sons are not really being uh, educated where they, can, where they can do things to really support these sisters. So that was their discussion. And a lot of sisters back then, and even perhaps now, are looking at the aftermath of many of our brothers not even available for a lot of their sisters. You feel me? And that's the reality. But this brother that was a teacher in the New York City public school system, he was bringing it out, and he was speaking about teacher expectations. The teacher pointed out that the school teachers negatively and subtly let the black males know that he's not really going to make it in the society. This is, huh? That's what they do. And it's done subtly. That's what Jawanza is saying in his book. It's done subtly. They're, they're subtly, negatively letting the child know that you're not going to quite make it. A good example of that was what was said to Malcolm X. Malcolm X said that he wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor. He was in the eighth grade. The white teacher said, oh, no, Malcolm, no. Certainly if you was a lawyer, my people would not come to you. And if you were a doctor, no, no. You'd be much better as a carpenter. Jesus was a carpenter. There's nothing wrong with the skill, but the fact that he wanted to use his ability in analytics. You feel me? And when, they, and when people don't have that expectation of you, you will succumb to their expectation of yourself. And you will begin to see yourself in a negative, in a negative viewpoint of those who are looking, who are supposed to be teaching you. You feel me? That's a very terrible thing. I particularly make it my business that when I come before you and we're here in this classroom, we're here in this sanctuary, y'all heard me say it many times. I said I do not tolerate mediocrity. I do not tolerate uh, slothfulness. 
because I expect the absolute best out of you. That's the reason why I talk that way, because I'm angry about this. You hear me? Maybe, no, maybe nobody's really had enough confidence in you to tell you that you could be greater than what you see yourselves as. So that's the reason why I work extra hard to make sure that you believe that. Don't ever just sit back and just rely on squalor and lean back. No. Dig deep within yourself and bring up the greatness that has been buried up underneath doubt. Pull that out because you are that great people. And if, and if I'm standing before you and say that I believe in you, you better have, you better have uh, dignity and self-respect for your own selves to lift your own selves up. If I believe in you, you better believe in yourselves. You hear me? I'm trying to undo the damage of what decades and hundreds of years have done. And we all are in that boat. You're great people. All of you. Magnificent people. You've just been, been, been buried underneath doubt because somebody did not have great expectations for you. You men. And women allow people to just run over you. No. No, because you feel like you're not quite good enough. God made you. If he made you, that means he has a purpose for you. Dig deep within your spirit and find out what that purpose is and work it. Y'all hear me? Okay, I'm going to leave that part there. Uh, now, uh, let's see. I said that the, the teacher pointed out, I'm done with the book. Oh, no, no, I'm not done with the book. Go to the pictures now. I ain't got to read no more of this. Um, the teacher pointed out that the school teachers negatively and subtly let the black males know that they are not really good. They are not really going to make it in this society. And, they, and if they speak up or challenge the negative indoctrination that's being subtly given to them, these same black males get labeled ADHD. They call them a troublemaker. They call him an upstart. They say all of these things because he's refusing to allow them to put him to sleep. They say he's too active. He's not, it's not that he's too active. He's fighting against the subtle indoctrination to put his brain to sleep. And they say, we don't want that. And then they try to put labels on him to affix him to a low self-esteem about himself. And if he has no self-esteem, he will resort to drugs. He will resort to crime. And then they got, the, they got the cells waiting for them. These are the things that we as men have to fix in our communities. And we have to be defiant in fixing those problems. Y'all hear me? We have to be unyielding and unbending. Now, I ain't got time to deal with nookers that want to argue over a damn corner. I ain't got time for that. None of us got time for that. We got too much work to do. There's too many people out there that need this gospel. Huh? Y'all all right? Now, uh, what time is it? Okay, I'm going to wind it down. I, I got to do a part two. Ain't no way in the world I'm going to get it all in. <laughs> but I, like you said, I'm not going to rush it. I'm not going to rush it. I'm going to uh, give me, pro, um, like I said, they label him as a troublemaker, which eventually sends him into a pipeline to prison. As defiant, righteous men of God, we must act now before we are totally destroyed. That's the reason why we must do what we do. That's the reason why we must have that fervent fire to get this word to our people that desperately need it. That we have to do that. That has to be, that has to be done. We have to do it. Because it's necessary. If it's necessary, then the determination to do it is a must. We have to do it. And that's, the, and that's the course that we roll them in. That's what Christ said. Christ said, if you love my, sh he said, if you love me, feed my sheep. They did not say that. So that's what we have to do. We ain't got time to squalor and mess around. Uh, let's see, let's see. Our plan is for that desire. And the desire is the kingdom of God. That's what we're desiring to make happen. Give me the book of Proverbs 29, 18. 
Proverbs 29, 18. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. If, there, if we don't, if, when we go into the neighborhoods and our kids are suffering from this low self-esteem and we have this hatred towards one another, we as godly men, as defiant men to stand up for God, we have to see that problem and, and come up with the solutions in the Bible to heal our people of those sicknesses, of those mental sicknesses. Read. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. So he that keepeth the laws of God, we're going to be happy because there will be resolutions and, and solutions to fix our people's problems when we deal with the laws of God. But it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Why is it that our people perish when there's no vision? Just like the kids in the school. Could we put them pictures back up there again? Zoom in on that. Here's an example. Here's the same kid that we was reading about that had all of this. Well, I didn't fully read it, but I'll just tell you about it. Within the page that we were looking at earlier, it mentions about the exuberance and the excitement that these kids. Look at, look at the, look, don't move it yet. Stay, stay where it's at. Look at, his, look at his face. This is how he is when he's in the school. Bright, smiling, excited. This is how we are when we come into the school system because in his mind, I'm going to exercise my mind. I'm going to exercise all of this greatness and this talent, and I'm going to be what I want to be. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to exemplify, and I'm going to, I'm going to use, I'm going to use my talent, and I'm going to establish my mark in the earth. That's the excitement that our kids come into the school class, in, into the classroom with. But then the teachers, that's on an agenda to destroy the aspirations of our sons. They begin to, to have low expectations of him. And they said, why are you even trying to be a doctor? Why are you even trying to be a lawyer or, or an architect or an engineer? Why are you even trying to do those things and try to discourage him? Malcolm said that when the teacher told him that, he dropped out, left school, and got into a life of crime, and then you know the rest of the story. But that's how it happens. Y'all hear me? These are the kinds of things that, that, that puts poison in our sons. And we wonder the reason why we have the problems that we have is because we're not paying attention to what's going on on the small circuit. You got, we got to deal with the whole nation, our kids, everybody. That's the vision that we're talking about. Where there is no vision, the people perish. If this kid is not able to express the, the excitement and, and the vision that's in his mind to do great things, and that's extinguished, and that fire of enthusiasm is extinguished, it will leave him to a life of despair. And that's what is happening. You feel me? So this exuberant uh, face on this brother, move now slide it up. Exuberance, he's happy. Let's read it. The innocence and lively, lively. interest typical of the early years of what you see here. It's like what I've been talking about, right? Y'all with me? What does it change into? Read, move on. It changes to this, apathy. Let's what the captions say. Move down. Let's get the words. The apathy and limited interest apparent as early as the fourth grade. This is where the ADHD comes in. This is where his, his a problem child. We don't understand what's going on because he's not being fed in the schools. And his interest has been capped. His aspirations have been capped. And he's stifled. Proverbs 13 and 12. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. This is what's happening to this young boy. Hope deferred. He, in his mind, as a young child in the third and the fourth grade, he has a particular hope. As a kid, he has a particular hope that he wants to be an astronaut, whatever. He wants to do great things. But his aspirations are killed right there in the killing field called the educational system. And when his aspirations are killed, he resorts to a cell phone with foolishness and frolic and madness, and he begins to, he begins to morph into a whole life of a, of a trajectory of evil and sin and wickedness and even homosexual, all kind of stuff that start pumping to this kid because they've removed him from where he was really trying to go. 
Read the scripture again. Hope deferred. So make, his hope and his aspirations are deferred to the point where they are out of his reach. In other words, they're non-existent. So it leaves him with no hope. It leaves him with no aspiration. No, the enthusiasm is gone. Nobody wants my talent. I raise my hand. Nobody calls on me. So what am I to do? In his mind, he's thinking. What am I to do? What does the scripture say? Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. The heart is the mind. It maketh the mind crazy. When your mind is crazy, you still have a spirit in you. The spirit, the spirit within you questions your reality. Listen to me good. Whenever we are suffering, because I'm going to bring it up to us now, because you see he's, he's, he, he's been relegated his whole life to his dump truck and his football. That's basically us. Grown men talking about some damn uh, Atari and video games. Basketball. That's the same damn thing. Huh? Cars and rims. Basically grown boys whose, whose growth has been stunned and stifled. And we've resorted to this and we have made a culture out of this. And then when, when, then, then, when my, then when I feel like I'm not a man because I can't do manly things, give me a gun so I can get my manhood that way. You looking at me. What you looking at me for, nigga? You sweating me for, nigga? Huh? That's where this comes from. It's all by design. We have to, off, we have to offset this. That's the pain and labor that we got to bring to this fight. You hear me? It's real. This is real. This is what we fight against. So here we are in a situation where the aspir the 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 uh, the the low self esteem, the vacant esteem, the uh, the low expectation, no aspiration begins to it becomes to be your world now. But while you while you're living in this cesspool of doubt there's a spirit in you that questions why are you allowing yourself to live like this talk to me you hear that voice and be like why is it that i'm stuck like this here and i can't move the way i know i should move because i'm a physical grown man but i'm not doing manly things i turn on the television and i see the other nations doing manly things but I'm not doing manly things. What's wrong with me? And your spirit questions that. And your, and, you get, and, your, and your spirit beats you down sometimes. And it's always in your ear. Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? And then you might have a woman that's getting on you at the same time because she's fed up. She's mad. Why can't we get this? Why can't we do that, do this? And he gets frustrated. And he doesn't want to deal with the, with the mouth of the woman. So what does he do? What does he do? He needs to drown that voice out. Because that voice is constantly working on him. How does he drown it out? Drugs. Alcohol. We get into bad behavior. Because we're trying to silence that voice. That's saying what we should be doing but we're not doing. Y'all feel me? It's a hell of a deal, right? This is what we got to fight against. This is what we have to fight against. It's a big job. It's a big job. But we're going to get it. We're going to do it. That's the reason why this Bible is here. It's the solution to our people's problems. We're all in the cesspool. We're all in the mess. I come from a broken home, mother and father. I've seen the damage of, of certain things coming up, and I've seen where things went off the rails. Family members, I've seen it. I've, li I've seen what drugs have done to Harlem. I've seen what alcohol has done to people. I worked in those kinds of facilities as well. I've seen it on the quote-unquote professional side and on the life side. I've seen it on both, on both sides. Total destruction. And when you see that, and the most I put a spirit on us to go inside this Bible and, and learn these solutions, how dare we not apply these solutions to fix our people? 
If you say you love your people, fix them. Somebody sought it to fix me. Somebody sought to hand the rope down to me to pull me up. Why can't I do that to my brothers and to my sisters? Y'all all right? Uh, what time is it? 8.30. Should I, should I stop here? Okay, yeah. All right, because I'm going to pick up next, uh, Lord willing, the next time I get to teach. I do want to mention one thing. I do want to mention one thing about, before I fully close up, I want to go to a video. I do want to do this here because I'm going to shift gears because I'm going to jump the gun a little bit. I'm going to jump way ahead. I'm going to jump way ahead. Um, I know about the order discipline. I do want to end with that, with the order discipline, but I want to show something before that. Show me, because we have played games and not been serious about looking after each other. You feel me? Listen to what I'm saying now. We allow certain levels of violence to happen to different brothers and sisters. Sandra Bland, Trayvon Martin, Rasheem Carter, Emmett Till, uh, give me Anthony Bias in New York, Yusuf Hawkins, and there the list goes on and on. You feel me? I mean, the list goes on and on. Alton Sterling goes on and on. How do we get to a point where our people can be killed and murdered with no outcry? Where they could just do it with impunity, basically, because we're not organized. And when I say we're not organized, I'm not talking about picking up a gun. I'm not talking about picking up a knife or any kind of thing like that. But if we give... How much, how much money do we give to the American economy? Trillions of dollars. If we love our people, come these holidays, because on Christmas alone, so-called Christmas, which is not God's holiday at all, on so-called Thanksgiving, these are not God's holiday at all. What we got there? I see you popped up something. Let's read that thing. Because this, this is what we give to the U.S. economy. I'm almost done. This is what we give to the U.S. economy every year. Could we read that, please? Put that up on the board. Let's, let's, let, let, let's see what this thing says. What just happened here? That's an ad. Come on. Come on. This is what we give to the, you're fine. I'm not looking. I can't see. We gonna, are we looking for it? Do we have it? We're still looking for it. Okay. We give so-called Christmas, Memorial's Day. Fourth of, Ju- Fourth of July's, July's, which is around the corner. Yeah. Y'all all right? They lied. You want no daggone freedom. What are you talking about? So, we give our money to celebrate these, ho- these holidays, these wicked hella days. And it basically shows that we have no respect for our own brothers and our own sisters who get murdered. If we were really serious about stopping that, and I know we got problems among our own selves. We got black on black and all. We do it to each other. You feel me? So we got to deal with that too. But for the ones that's being, for us to be killed the way we're being killed by others, you feel me? None is, none is better than the other. Don't get me wrong. But I'm making a point in concerning like Rasheem Carter. His mother, Tiffany Carter, is being traumatized over and over and over again as they keep finding new remains. Like I said last time I was here, I'll forget what class it was. Many of you sisters got sons, and I hate to use this as an example. You have sons. Imagine your son being, God forbid, your son being missing and nobody's telling you anything. And as months go on, see, my point is about the empathy of my sister. We have to have that empathy for our people. And they're finding fragments. One month, another month, another part. Another month. Every time this stuff's happening, it's opening up more wounds. To, that's, that's a level of terrorism and trauma that nobody should feel. Nobody should be going through that. And then on top of it, why was he killed? And nobody's even really dealing with that. So we want justice. 
You got everybody come together at the rally and all of that. And I remember saying, well, listen, the rally is fine, but when you leave here, what you going to do when you go back home? Are you going to celebrate these wicked holidays? Because God ain't with it. The scriptures tell you that. Our high holy days are in the Bible. Follow that. I say, you'll be doing two things. First of all, you'll be pleasing the Lord by following his holy days as the Israelites. And the other thing that you'll be doing, you'll be putting some pressure on these people that kill our people with impunity. That's what we need to do. I said, if you're serious about loving your brothers and your sisters, you do that. Just start with that. There's no violence in that. That's just you simply exercising how you want your money to represent you. There's nothing hard about that. What we got? We got something? Come on. What do we got? How much does a black household spend? How much? Oh, man, that's a good one. Uh, I guess it took time to find the right one. How much does a black household spend? According to black consumer spending statistics, black households spend an estimated $835 billion in 2019. So that means it's much more now. Say that. Read that number again. Black households spend an estimated $835 billion in 2019 and are projected to reach a buying power of $1.8 trillion by 2024. $1.8 trillion by 2024. Can we compare that number to nations, the GDP of nations on this earth? Keep that number in mind, brothers and sisters. Show you how messed up we are. Can we compare? Y'all know what I'm looking for? Y'all understand what I'm asking about? Okay, just give me, a, just give us a second. We're going to compare this amount of money that we spend to absolute, to actual sovereign nations. <laughs> this is the nominal GDP ranking by country: the United States, China, Japan, Germany, uh, United Kingdom, France, India, and Italy. Okay, and what are we looking at? The nominal GDP ranking by country. Right, we read those. Give me more items because it's, it's two point eight. So this is this, this is the top ten. Is there more countries after this? Let's come on down the line. Let's see what we fit in at. Let's see where we fit in at as black people that don't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out. Let's see what nations did we beat. Number eight, Italy. <laughs> 2.7 trillion. Number nine, Brazil, 1.8 trillion. Go ahead. Number 10, Canada, 1.7 trillion. In one year, Canada spent $1.7 trillion. Go back to the black households again. It says, and projected to reach a buying power of $1.8 trillion. So we spend more money than Canada. Just black people. Do you see the need for leadership? Do you see the need for us to really get in there and deal with our people? So when I was making a point about Rasheem Carter and the rest of our people, uh, Trayvon and all the, the man sell the damn gun after he want the white man wanted the gun smoke. He said, I want that gun. I want the gun that killed that nigger. So I want that gun. I want to smell the smoke. The damn gun sold for damn near how, how much did the gun sell for? 250000 a quarter of a million dollars. A regular cheap ass gun. So for that, this is horrible. But this is the mockery that they make out of us because we do not deal the way we should be. There should be a level of discipline to say, listen, for my sister Tiffany to be going through this and all the other mothers and the fathers and all of us that have lost sons and daughters through evil and wickedness. Yeah, how much? $250,000. Look at that. That dog don't make no doggone sense. All right, we saw it. Take it down, man. Look at that. Uh, that so that gun is probably oh, I ain't gonna get in there. Somebody think I know something, but that gun probably uh, probably ain't worth two hundred and fifty dollars. Y'all all right? So get get rid of that. But dig this now. This kind of stuff goes on because we're not serious. 
Rah, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But then we go back and we continue. To, that's the reason why these things happen to us, because there's no, there's no pressure from us. And this is not inciting violence or rioting or anything. This is simply saying, why don't we organize to make sure that our dollars count for us? Number one, because God's laws tell us not to spend in these holidays. And two, we want justice for what happened to our people. And that's what the problem is. We don't do that. We're too busy fighting each other and missing the bigger picture. This could be your son. This could be your daughter. This is horrible. This is horrible. Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh I'm going to stop there. I know we got announcements. I had some stuff that I did want to show. Uh, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. Give me, I'm gonna jump to jump to my videos. I haven't really played any videos. But I'm since I'm talking about Rasheem Carter, I'm gonna go a step further and go back a little bit and talk about James Bird. Y'all all right? And the reason why I'm doing this because I want to exercise in us empathy. Don't play it yet. I want to exercise in us empathy. The Bible says, give me that, give me that law in the Bible about love thy neighbor as, uh, yeah, now there's one about ha have them do unto you. Well, both of them, actually. They're both good. They're both good. Just hang on. Just hang on. We're almost done. We're almost done. I got to bring this in here. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 7. And there's the one that says, have do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the one I'm looking for. Yeah. Yes. Sir. Let's read that one. Listen to this here. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you. Listen good. Oh, read it again. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you. This is the unity that we have to come back to as the nation of Israel, brothers and sisters. Like I said, you are a beautiful people. You are a wonderful people. You are a special people. All of you. All of the Israelites. You are God's greatest creation. Read it again. Therefore. All things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you. All of us. Whatever you would want someone to do to you. Think about the things that we would want people to do to us. And for us. And the things that you would not have people to do to you or to do against us. We got many things. C can I get a witness? You want to want nobody to steal from you, rob from you, or rape, or, or stab, or whatever. You would not want people to do these things to you, would you? So why would you do it to others? Why would you do it to your brother or sister? We should have that kind of empathy for our sisters and our brothers all over. If I, would not, if I don't want you to do certain things to me, why would I do it to you? That's the love that we're supposed to have for each other. Our people have to be taught this. Read. Do ye even so to them. Do what you would have them do to you, you do that to them. We would deal with each other with kindness, love, respect, reverence, honor. So that's what we would have people do to us. So why don't we give that back to them? Right? That's the easy thing, right? Yes, sir. That's the law. If we simply did that, we would be okay. But here's the point. Here's the reason why I bring it up. That's it on that, right? For this is the law in the prophets. This is the law and of in the prophets. That's in the Bible. That's how we're supposed to live. As simple as that. If we understood that, and I'm going back to the rally now. Everybody protesting and all of that. In different rallies, wherever they be at, New York, whatever. We rah, rah, rah and all of that. Meanwhile, the mother's grieving. The father's grieving. The people are hurt terribly. Why don't you put yourselves in that woman's shoes? Why don't you put yourself in that brother's shoes and have empathy? That's the reason why I talk about that. Have empathy. Put yourself in their suffering. And what could I do to ease the suffering of my sister? What could I do to ease the suffering of my brother? That's the love that we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have that. And if we did that, we could stop a lot of this evil. Because whenever you hurt my brother, you hurt me. Whenever you hurt my sister, you hurt me. 
And I'm not going to stand for that because the pain that you did to him, you did it to me. When you went, I, I put myself in Rashim's Carter. I tried my best to put myself being terrorized and chased in the woods with a stick trying to fight off his attackers. And they're they taking pictures of him and passing this picture around in the truck stop. And, he's, and death is imminent. And he's knowing that these people are going to kill me. And put yourself in that posture to think about that. And think about the mother that has to learn this thing. And because we don't exercise that real unity, they said we could do it over and over and over and over again because they will never unite to make sure that things like this don't happen. And how is it that these things happen? Because we continue to support those wicked hell days while our brothers are missing, while our sisters are missing. While our mothers are strung out on drugs and all that, all of this is by the hand of an enemy that caused your sons to have no hope. Apathy set in. No, no, no inspiration to nothing. And he resorted to drugs and dope and alcohol. And we allow it by still supporting the same system in wickedness. Be defiant against it. I ain't telling you to break any laws, but what law says that you have to spend on Christmas? What law says you have to celebrate Thanksgiving? What law says you have to deal with this Easter bunny and all that madness? There's none at all. You can alone just do that. And you'd be surprised how much of a change you can make. They'll bring justice to that situation immediately. They'll find the criminals that did it. But because we ain't putting the pressure on them, because we're too damn comfortable in the good times. And these good times is going to bring us to hard times and destruction and death. So situations like what I'm about to play on this thing here is the thing about empathy. I'm going to show you this here. This is about James Byrd. How many of y'all remember him? How many of y'all don't know when I say James Byrd, hands up in the air? This is horrible. The, James Byrd was a black man that, was, that lived in Jasper, Texas. That was chained, that was tied, white boys chained him to a back of a pickup truck and dragged his body for miles. Y'all heard what I said? Like I pointed out, before they wrapped the chains on him, he was a full living human being. A full man. Legs, arms, head, everything. Full human. They tied chains on him and dragged him behind a pickup truck on a gravel strip. For over a mile until he was dead. When I say empathy, imagine you being chained up and dragged like that. I imagined it. I imagined it of going through that kind of horror. And if we really felt that serious about not another one would go through this here. Not another Sandra Bland or Trayvon Martin or Rasheem Carter. I would hope that all of my brothers and sisters join me and not celebrate any of these damn holidays. You could just start with that. Play this film. I'm getting ready to bring some reality to you now. This is a movie. Or was a movie. Y'all all right? A reenactment of what happened to my brother James Byrd. And even in the reenactment, even in the a uh, reenactment, you can feel it. Just imagine what he felt literally going through that. Hit me. That was his wallet. Now, the, hold on, hold on. the disclaimer is blocking. The, they, they're pulling the chain out the box that was used to drag this man to his death. Parental uh, guidance is suggested. I better say that as a disclaimer. Okay. Parental, dis, parental uh, guidance is suggested. Play on.
that's the chain that they dragged him with. They, they brought that in the court as evidence of what was used to drag this man to his death. Play on. Those were the defendants. What kind of mind state would you have sitting there? Hold on. What kind of mind state would you have sitting there in a courtroom and they actually pulling out the chain and going over the events of what happened to this man? How could you leave out of there and not want to have make a change to this stuff that happened? They don't do this to other people. They don't do this to white folks. They don't do this to Chinese. Understand what I'm saying? They don't do this to the other nations because the other nations, like when that white, when that uh, uh, Chinese guy got got beat up on the plane, all China went to back him up. But when it comes to us, no outcry, no real, no real organization to offset this kind of stuff here. Give me my next video. Parental the guidance again. Go ahead. This is in the this is in the trial. These are some gruesome images. Come on. Now here you can see the abrasions to the back lateral buttocks and posterior thighs. It's a laceration to the left mid back and a large ground down area over the sacrum and buttocks, ground down to the lumbar spine. Now there's an obvious difference in the shape of the wounds on the buttocks. What does that tell you? So he's so they they're examining his torso in the court and he's looking at how the abrasions are on different parts of his body so they have to relive how did he get these abrasions the way he got them go ahead this is the forensic Opinion, guy here while being dragged mr bird was attempting to relieve the pain and injuries he was receiving <laughs> So as a pause it, pause it. So as you're being dragged, understand you're not on your feet. As you're being dragged, one part of your body is hitting that road. So you try to rock over to get some relief from that, and then you're eroding another part of your body. While well, that's happening to him. Put yourself in that situation. So as the pain is just getting more and more intense, he's trying to move over to the side to try to relieve the pain of that, and it's causing another one. That's the terror that happened to us. Talk about a hate group? You got to be kidding me. Play on. This uh, dragging was very painful. In my mind, he was trying to relieve the pain by swapping one portion of his body for the other to get relief and to keep his head off the ground. No question in your mind that James Bird Jr. was still alive and he was chained and dragged. No question whatsoever. Pause it. Because the abrasions was on different parts of his body, you know he was alive trying to relieve himself. So that man was alive while he was being dragged. So my point that I made a couple of weeks ago, I, I don't remember what platform I was teaching on, but I said, imagine him being a full human brother. And as he's being dragged, percentages of his life is being extinguished from him as he's being dragged. Play on. And the cause of death was when his head and shoulder were ripped off. Yes, his he his was, head uh, got cut. His head got cut off in that drain tunnel. Go ahead. Till that time. What did it say there? Back it up a little bit. I was just gonna hear what he said. Go ahead. Yes, he was uh, alive till that time. He was Thank alive you. until the time his head was decapitated. So as we see this here, that's the end of that, right? That was it. Go ahead, play it on out so we can be done with it. So these are the faces of the brothers in court, the people that's witnessing and listening to these things here. Okay, that's it. Take it off, take it off, take it off, take it off, take it off. Take it off, take it off, take it off. Okay. So, Rasheem Carter, 
I had a video on him. Emmett Till, I got information on that. All of these things we have to imagine. We have to put ourselves in that. When you see your brothers and sisters on drugs, when you see your brothers and sisters is caught up in different things that you know is a, is a detriment to them, we should have empathy for those brothers and sisters and try to organize within ourselves to help alleviate these problems. All of this is biblical. All of this is biblical. Give me Zephaniah 2 and 1. I'm going to end it there. I'm going to end it there. Zephaniah 2 and 1. I'm going to stop there. I got a lot more, but I'm going to deal with the rest of it later. Y'all all right? It's been a long day, I know. Zephaniah 2 and 1. Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired. O nation not desired. The whole world hates us, and we supposed to unite together and understand that we are all, if one of us is hated, we are all hated. Right. That's what we have to do. We have to learn that. We have to learn that. We have to learn it. Give me one, one last scripture. Um, uh, Zephaniah 3 and Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore, wait ye upon me. The Most High is going to redeem us from this hell that we're in. It is our job to maintain a defiant discipline that's going to help us rise above the temptation of slothfulness and mediocrity. Because we have a hell of a fight ahead of us. We got to get this truth to our people and we ourselves have to be disciplined and defiant and maintaining these commandments. And we have to live by this code. Okay? Read it again. Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. Until the day that the Lord rise up to the prey. Go ahead. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them my indignation. The Lord is going to burn these nations up for what they did to us. So I wanted to give you that good note there to let you know that the Lord sees all of this. But in our waiting, we can't just wait without sitting on our hands. A lot of times people hear that wait. I'm just going to wait on the Lord. No. There's work that got to be done, pain and labor to be done right. while we wait. That's my point, all right? Is that it on that? Even all my fierce anger. Even all my fierce anger, the Lord is going to deal with these nations because all of us are the children of the Most High, and we are the apple of God's eye, and he did not forget nothing. Okay, I got all that information in here. I guess i deal with it on the next time I bring this class out. Y'all all right? I know y'all worn out, tired, but it's all right. <laughs> but I'm going, I'm going, is that it on that? For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For all of the kingdoms shall be devoured with the fire of the Lord's jealousy for the nation of Israel. You're such a beautiful people. Always remember that. And we must carry ourselves that way. We have to carry ourselves in being defiant and keeping God's commandments and that love for each other. In that ordered discipline that the Lord has lined up for us. Y'all all right? All right. With that, I'm going to. Uh, in this segment, and uh, we're going to uh, give all praise to the Most High. I hope y'all got something out of today's class so far. Okay. But before we go to any of these, get my things on the, the missing persons. We got to do that before we go into these things here. I want to get these things in. Come on, brothers, on the side. Then I'm, okay. Uh, 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 us uh, having a love for our people, we have to keep this campaign going. When I say this campaign going, we have our sisters that are missing and our brothers that are missing. We, we've, we've had that campaign going on for years. And this is an example of us using whatever platform. We have to be wise whatever, with, with whatever tools that we have to bring awareness to the problems that's going on with our people and to, break this and to get this gospel to them as well. So here we are, because we've been having, we've been experiencing for years now, a lot of our sisters are going missing, and nobody knows where they're at. Where they at? What's happening to them? Where are they? These, these girls and these boys were somebody's daughter, were somebody's son. How is it that they're just missing and nobody cares? 
This is sickening, man. Missing persons. Here we go. Come on. What you got? Uh, who's going to? I can read it since I'm looking at it. Right? You got Bishop. it? Come on. Missing persons. Name, Nakira Ellis, 18, female, black, eye color brown, height. Her hair color is black. Her eye color is brown. Go ahead. Height, 5 foot 4 inches. Her weight is 200 pounds. Last seen date, February 17th, 2023. Since February, she's been missing. Nobody has seen any. Since February, she's been missing. She's from Lindman, South Carolina. Lyman, wow. South Carolina. What Lyman, I'm sorry. What did I say, Lindman? <laughs> Ly Lyman, South Carolina. Been missing since February. Where's this girl at? What basement is she ch chained up in? Who? Nobody knows. Go ahead, read on. Statement from family or police. She may travel to Easley or Spartanburg, South Carolina. When she was last seen, her hair was in black and orange braids. Nakira may wear glasses and a nose ring. If anyone has information regarding the whereabouts of Nakira Ellis, contact the Special Victims Unit at 800-835-0304 or contact Crime Stoppers at 888-274-6372 or visit www.p3ttips.com. Okay, and you see the scripture, Deuteronomy 28, chapter, verse 41. Thou, thou shalt, shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. We're trying to reverse all of these curses, brothers and sisters. We got another one? So remember these things, brothers and sisters. Here's a brother. What do we got here? Deshaun Boswell, age 19, sex, male, hair color, black, eye color, brown, height, 5 foot 10, weight, 200 pounds. Last seen, January 12th, 2023. Last seen location, Fox Point Drive, Charlotte, North Carolina. Damn. Statement from family or police. On January 12th, 2023, Mr. Boswell left his home heading to an unknown destination. Mr. Boswell has not contacted family or friends since. If you have any information on his location, please call 911. Now, we don't know if these, this brother or the sister's dead. We don't know anything. Since January and February, are you kidding me? Go ahead. If anyone has information regarding the whereabouts of Deshaun Boswell, contact the Special Victims Unit at 704-336-4978 or contact Crime Stoppers at 704-334-1600 or visit www.p3tips.com. Deuteronomy 28 and 41. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them. For they shall go into captivity. Okay, all right. Show the whole picture. Show the whole thing. So you see this is a campaign that we've been dealing with for years. So we're still on the case, brothers and sisters. I've been saying that, and maybe some people didn't believe me. But we're still on this. Because when one of us hurt, we all hurt. And that's what we have to remember. What is nation? Nation is family. Nation is community. Nation is men leading by example. Nation is women's support. Nation is children with role models. Nation is unity. Nation is you. It's Nation Time. Fire!